we are live. Welcome to 1983's Videodrome Review and Thoughts. Once again, happy Spooktober. And yes, I know some people say this isn't a horror movie, and I happen to disagree with those people. So, yeah, this is a movie I really, really love, and there will be some jokes in this video, and I will definitely get serious. So, let's see. Yeah, this video, uh, the movie is rated R, and so is this video. And. Yes, so there will be no spoilers until I get into the thoughts section. And if I decide to spoil something, I will verbally warn before I do so. Hold up an index finger until I'm done with the spoiler so you can mute and skip ahead until you see me lower my index finger. So. Yeah, for this video, I'm going off the unrated version. I'm not sure I've ever seen any of the other versions and I honestly don't know how many times the, the first viewing must have been around like the year 2000 and I mean I'm it's in the dozens maybe two or three dozens of viewings since then I may or may not have worn out the original VHS tape and yeah, so the plot, a programmer at a TV station that specializes in adult entertainment searches for the producers of a dangerous and bizarre broadcast. And let's see. Right, I am just going to make sure I do. There we go, that is a lot better. So, I am going to briefly rank the, yeah, this is a ranking of all of the Cronenberg movies that I have myself watched, and the ranking is worst to best, keeping in mind I love all of them, they're all amazing, I'm ranking how much I love them, not whether or not I love them all. The Brood, The Dead Zone, Naked Lunch, Eastern Promises, Scanners, Spider, History of Violence, Dangerous Method, Existence, and The Fly. I will let you know where Videodrome lands in that at the end of the review. So if you absolutely can't wait to find out, you can skip ahead to the first thought section and go back a little bit. I am just really quickly going to... And there we go. Okay, so, yeah, the reason I decided to do a video on this movie is because of the, the depth and the practical effects, which are both excellent. And this, you know, this is a movie that I keep, like... The more I watch it, the better I understand it, and the more I appreciate all it has to say. You know, even though the movie's older than I am. And... Yeah, the, the all the technical aspects, like, you know, this is, all, this is made by people who are very talented, and there's a lot of skill and enthusiasm on display. And... I'm just briefly gonna gonna note that it's kind of wild researching this movie because reviews range from it was weird, I didn't like it, to here's what the movie means according to Baudrillard. It's yeah. You know, some people watch this expecting just like, you know, a very straightforward horror movie. And again, this I I think this is one of the scariest movies ever made. It's 
the the concepts within are legitimately just horrifying in yeah so getting into the writing so in total David Cronenberg has written 18 movies and oh right a yeah. couple of them are yeah um, he you know he has credits on IMDb for scanners 2 and 3 based on original characters created by so yeah 16 movies he's and yeah the the movie uh, let's see right something something worth noting for this movie and other early Cronenberg this is uh, this is the direct quote from from him when we made this movie the money for filmmaking would be there late in the year not early so we would sometimes start shooting without a finished script that was the case on this movie some things we would simply have to feel out and that is definitely something there there are times in this where you can tell they didn't have absolutely everything you know planned out yeah the the writing you know sometimes I talk about how like if I find the character psychologically credible this isn't really a movie where that's the main goal of the characters the characters there's always something there you know you might not realize it right away maybe it's only when you think back on the movie afterwards but none of the characters you know there's no there's no wasted character here there's no character like if if a character has a name and more than one line there's something there for you to, to look at and let's see um yeah the concepts like the the exploration of concepts is is very very compelling and I suppose that pretty much covers the the writing if you watch a lot of his movies like I have you'll definitely notice there are some similarities between the, the various ones and yeah that's definitely the case here the movies handling of plot twists is excellent uh, there are not too many none of them are bad there are not too few and they're not too easy to figure out for the viewer and it's not the kind of movie that falls apart once you learn the the twist yeah this is a movie like you can even watching it multiple times there are things that you you know it's not just oh you know plot twist happens and it's like okay everything before this means that then okay I get it they were like hiding the identity of this character so that once the plot twist happened we'd be like oh no this is like you you have to think about it and yeah so this was also directed by Cronenberg who acted in 22 movies he has 10 TV acting credits not sure I've seen him in any TV other than alias four shorts two video and yeah he directed 24 movies uh, two of them are segments for from overall movies and it is also like you gotta try to watch some of the really early stuff like there's a huge difference between the brood and existence for example and So, right, in my old review I wrote, This is terrifying and bizarre and will stay in your mind for quite a while. It's been ten years since my original viewing, and yet I remembered almost everything, shy a few details. And, yeah, I have some critic quotes. This was the first studio movie David Cronenberg made because his independent ones were so popular. And that's also some, again, there's a difference between this and The Brood. Like, you can definitely tell that there was a bit more you know bought behind this one a lot of people think of David Cronenberg only for the fly which is understandable but every single movie of his is worth watching 
Direction, 8 out of 10. David Cronenberg keeps pace with our emotions and intrigue as he draws us in. Most viewers have one specific movie which terrifies them so much they can hardly watch it, one which cuts bone deep to their deepest unspoken fears. For me, that movie has always been Canadian horror auteur David Cronenberg's 1983 classic, Videodrome. David Cronenberg has never gone out of his way to find innovative sh ways to shoot his films. If the graphic body violence is explicit, the rest of the presentation is restrained and minimalist. He favors muted colors, textures found in the plastic of car interiors, cinematography which makes use of empty space without calling attention to itself. His actors don't deliver naturalistic performances, instead behaving with that Canadian detachment which pervades the work of Cronenberg and his video era counterpart Atom Egoyan. What is probably most amazing about Videodrome is how well it holds up nearly 20 years later. Director David Cronenberg made no attempt to give Videodrome a high-tech or futuristic feel. Instead, he opted for a low-tech retro atmosphere. This is not a story about what is going to happen, but was what has already happened right under our noses. The televisions are often black and white and look like the large boxy wooden TVs of the 1960s instead of the plastic ones of the 80s. Video tapes are beta standard, even though in 1982 when the movie was made, beta was losing market share to VHS. Moreover, the areas of the city where Cronenberg chose to shoot all have a squalid appearance. This is a city in a state of disuse, and that may be because everyone is more concerned about what's going on in the little plastic box than the world around them. And yeah, so the opening, I will start with a critic quote. The opening of the film is a character on Max's TV waking up Max telling him his appointment for the day. That is how much technology has invaded the personal lives and interpersonal relationships of the character. And I would add that, you know, it's, it's the character Bridie who tells him it is time to slowly, painfully, ease back into consciousness. Now, on the surface, this might appear to just be a variation of, honey, I know you don't want to wake up, but you have to. But, on a deeper level, reality has, at this point, become the worst part of his existence. He much prefers the fiction that makes up his, you know, his job is to find fiction to put on the, the um, network. And yeah, and, and the very first shot is the title appearing through TV white noise distortion static. So I am not going to go away whether the ending is happy or sad, but it fits with what came before. I think it's absolutely perfect. There is no Deus Ex Machina or other convenient writing, and it's just, yeah, I, it's, it's, it's so good. I will I will talk about details in the in the thought sections. I would say the movie never loses your interest, but it definitely is like what I've seen. People people who don't like it, they found that too much of the plot was unclear and that I mean, essentially, they weren't that intrigued. The, the mystery didn't really grab them. And for sure, if that, if that doesn't happen for you, yeah, for, for sure, uh, you know, the movie isn't going to be for you. Because it really, it's, it's about what's really going on and what that says about, yeah, what, what it has to say. The, the commentary and it really is a yeah and you know keeping in mind the first time I watched it I was a teenager and I watched it with another teenager and you know like other than movies like this we were watching you know alien movies predator movies um, yeah you know so so it's not like our tastes were the most refined I'm to be clear the original Alien movie is a very refined movie, and I love the sequel, and there's there's definitely refined elements to it, you know. Anyway, the, the, um, yeah, I'm one of the, yeah, yeah, never mind. Uh, our tastes were not the most refined, and yet this really grabbed us, you know, it's, yeah, so it's not, 
that you can only watch it if you are already someone with but but yeah you know if if the mystery if you don't care about the mystery from fairly early on the movie might not really have much, you know other than the practical effects so James Woods plays a Max Wren. Now, when I think of James Woods, I usually think of his roles playing criminals, like in Once Upon a Time in America, Casino, The Specialist. Now, in those, he plays a character as skeezy as he does here, but other than that, there are a lot of differences, and his performance here is solid. You know, you know yeah, in this and in those, I actually forgot that it was James Woods playing this role in one years long break from watching this like you know the moment I he's, he's a very he's a memorable performer you know he's and and his his look is very distinct you know but yeah like I completely forgot the the yeah and and that is the thing like Cronenberg he chooses really interesting actors and gives them roles that are really memorable in in a lot of these now, right, from my old... When we meet him, he's already quite desensitized from all the emotional content and stimuli he gets daily, and without any effort other than to keep his eyes open. You know, this is not like... You know, if, if it's not like TV, maybe you're like on a really great date, you have to make an effort. You can't just sit there and watch, you know, like it is with TV. And, you know, passing actual conflict without considering helping out. Uh, yeah, it, very, very early scene, there's this, like, he goes to meet these, you know, people who are selling something that maybe isn't completely legal. It's, you know, a little questionable. So, yeah, they've decided that they're going to hole up in this, like, place that's not, particularly appealing and as he walks to the the room you know he hears a woman screaming from another room and it's not that he doesn't notice because you can clearly see there's oh wow what it makes him do is he he knocks i think i guess harder or faster on the door to where he has business to you know it doesn't make him think oh wow i should that that woman needs help it makes him think oh crap someone's going to get arrested i don't want to be a part of this i just want to do this deal and go this has impeccable acting with woods giving a performance that is very unlike what we usually see from him and shining from the first frame and yeah, so some critic quotes. This is one of James Wood's only horror roles. James Woods is fascinating as TV producer Max Wren, who is desperate for an extreme new program. Woods is charming, sleazy, hilarious, clever, intense, sarcastic, and grounded. Woods' twisted character is given a realistic center with his nuanced performance. He is curious and lively in a way few Woods' roles have been since his lightning in a ball acting within Videodrome. Videodrome is arguably James Woods' finest acting. I think Cronenberg cast the perfect man to play sleazy creep and excitable weirdo in james woods oh and ah, sleazy creep right there we go i realized some of this is going fast my back is killing me but what else is new max wren as played by james woods is a deeply unsympathetic unsymp character his appetite for sadistic entertainment and his pursues his his pursuit of rougher and rougher content is skeevy enough, but he's the same kind of asshole who in recent years would have been the poster boy for the Me Too movement. He engages in sexual harassment in his office, he hallucinates striking his girl Friday, he publicly hits on Nikki Brand while they're being interviewed on television. It's purely an accident that the character and the actor who plays him are so closely aligned, given that James Woods in our reality has been identified by a number of women as a complete creep. This is synchronicity at work, something that the filmmakers could not have planned, but it's of a piece. As a right-wing crank, Woods appears to have succumbed to the video drum signal at last. They inhabit a nether world of insomnia and nicotine where the television never really sleeps, and we never really switch it off. Very well played by Woods, who bears a passing resemblance to Cronenberg when trying on a pair of glasses. And Debbie Harry plays Nikki Brand, who hosts... An emotional support hotline 
The Emotional Rescue Show, the abbreviation of which is T-E-R-S, which could be pronounced tears. And, yeah, it is legitimately, like, there's this part, we, we see her on the, on the radio hosting this, and, like, you know, the other person is is crying and sobbing, and it is this thing of, like, you know, I, I it's, it seems like Nikki is helping people, but it is also this, like, it's all, it's, it's a different kind of pornography, it's, it's emotional porn, you know, the, this, this thing of, you know, calling in into a radio show and, and crying in front of the world, you know, not, not like visually, but audibly, you know, yeah. She was the singer in Blondie, but she was not cast to capitalize on that. I have to admit, I don't know that much about Blondie, but yeah, some people are really happy that she was in both this and that, but yeah, she gives, I, I would not have guessed. Like, I only found out she was a singer when I started doing research for this, I guess, a couple of months ago. You know, before that, I thought, oh, you know, actress, because she, she's so good in this movie. So, uh, yeah, critic quotes, Deborah Harry playing love interest to Max Renz, she sells each line and is mesmerizing in her scenes, written, in, written intriguingly complex for a supporting role. Nikki's explanation of our parasitic relationship with technology is as true as it was back in the early 80s. Well, I think we live in overstimulated times. We crave stimulation for its own sake. We gorge ourselves on it. We always want more, whether it's tactile, emotional, or sexual. And, right, Sonia Smits plays Bianca Oblivion. Now, one critic did say Smits is the only one who occasionally looks a bit stiff in front of the camera. I didn't really think there was anything wrong with her performance, but she definitely, there, there are some concepts and, and lines that she has to sell that maybe she felt, you know, were a little too weird. And I don't really have much to say about the other. Yeah, that's those are the characters that I am going to. And yeah, so the. Right, so according to Wikipedia, accumulation of the cast and crew started in the summer of 1981 in Toronto, with most of the supporting actors being local performers of the city. You know, it's it's a way to save money and, and time. And, yeah, so, another critic quote, acting 8 out of 10, James Woods gets help from great performances by Peter Dvorsky and Sonia Smiths. And... Let's see. Yeah, so that brings us to the dialogue. Now, on the IMDb quotes, in the IMDb quote section, there are 34 entries, and all of them are good. Another critic quote, dialogue 9 out of 10. Most of the time, Cronenberg's script just wants to get straight to the point. And it's it's true, there's really no wasted lines. You know, there are, there are like, monologues. There are times where one character will have several lines in a row without without a, a visual, uh, you know, to, to spice things up. Or, uh, yeah, with, without much visual, much in the way of visuals to spice, spice things up. And without really in interacting with another character, uh, you know, or the other character very only mildly interacting with them or re reacting to them maybe or something but it never wastes there's there's not a word wasted in this like there are lines where like the first time you watch you're like what was that about but as you watch it more and as you piece everything about the movie together you realize it really is all you know yeah it's it's it sets things up it develops things explains things and that's very important in in this movie this is a movie where there are some very far out concepts and they tend they're they're frequently explained verbally you know which which I do think works well in in part because that means that you know if if something is conveyed visually then you can't have a character 
asking a question of that. You, but the moment that one character is explaining something to another character, the character being explained to can be like, does this, does that mean this? And then you have, you know, so, yeah. And this definitely, you know, if, if you've watched a Cronenberg movie, you know that he does have some, some really incredible visuals, frequently with violence and gore, almost exclusively done with practical effects. And, yeah, the, there's some really great uh, character development. The, the characters, uh, you know, we'll, you'll see multiple characters in tremendously varied circumstances. Uh, you know, when Max is introduced, we see, you know, his, his home and how, you know, where he sleeps and, you know, but then you also see, which, which you know, it's, it's not the nicest place in the world, but it's a place to live. And then he goes to this, I is it a hotel? I, I guess it almost must be where, like, women are being beaten so that they scream so that you can hear it down the hallway. And that's also, you know, nobody else is helping. Like, he just got there and he's hearing these screams. What about the other people who live there? You know, she, she it doesn't seem like this is the first scream she's given this, you know, this particular morning. So, yeah. So the cinematography was handled by Mark Irwin, who has 78, including some upcoming 78 movie credits as cinematographer. Yeah, let's see. So the, yes, some credit quotes. Mark Irwin's cinematography is striking in his effectiveness. He captures odd visuals with smooth smooth panning shots, and glorious mid-shots that leave you shaken. Cinematography, 10 out of 10. Mark Irwin keeps Videodrome seeping out of our TVs for the duration. Working in tandem with Rick Baker's effects, the cinematography of Mark Irwin, Scream, is another huge part of Videodrome's effectiveness. Irwin was David Cronenberg's steady cinematographer for the early part of his career, up to and including The Fly in 1986. Cronenberg's early films have the dark grittiness that is Irwin's signature. Videodrome is no exception. Videodrome is painstakingly lit to look like it isn't. And Irwin gets extra credit for dealing with photo photographing all the television sets in the film with very few visual roll bars. Mark Irwin knew what David Cronenberg wanted with Videodrome, and he delivered it in spades. And the editing was handled by Ronald Sanders, who has 33 movie editing credits. And, yeah, he has edited other Cronenberg. And, uh, I guess I can... Yeah, so, Scanners, Dead Zone, The Fly... Naked Lunch and Butterfly Crash, Existence, Spider, History of Violence, Eastern Promises, A Dangerous Method, Cosmopolis, and Maps to the Stars. So yeah, they are very comfortable working together. The editing is sharp and tight, and uh, critic quote, editing 8 out of 10. Roland Sanders delivers once again, as he did with The Fly, intensifying every shot. And, yeah, so this had a budget of 5.9 million, which was way bigger than Cronenberg had up to this point. Unfortunately, the box office was only 2.1 million, and that is, this is, this is not really a crowd pleaser. This is kind of something that you put on and focus intensely on. It's not really something like... You know, I've never watched this in a movie theater, but I could imagine, especially for the people that hadn't watched it before and didn't completely know, because this is this is probably the trippiest movie that Cronenberg had made up to this point. You know, all of his movies have I, I, uh, a couple of there are a couple of exceptions, but most of his movies have like concepts that are unusual in in one way or another. But this one really does, like, yeah, that's that's why I love it so much. That's one of the reasons I love it so much. And, yeah, you know, the, the budget shows. It's, you know, like I mentioned earlier, like, like uh, one, of the, one of the critic quotes that I quoted, it is set in a lot of, like, 
dilapidated areas, but it doesn't feel like, oh, that was just the only place they could shoot. It's clearly a, a conscious decision that they made there. And yeah, this was filmed in Toronto. And let's see. Right, from 19th October of 1981 to 19th December of 1981. So that is, you know, they, they, they may, not have, may not have had a completed script when they started, but they definitely did you know, they had time to make sure they got everything that they already knew they wanted. And the set design, credit quote, art direction, 10 out of 10. Carol Spear authenticates Videodrome's creepiness with matching sets. And costumes, 10 out of 10. Delphine White makes it all work with simple 80s fashion and a touch of bad. That was another credit quote. And... I am gonna get into the yeah the uh, I'm not gonna give away who but there is at least one antagonist in this and they are a, a memorable character and the music score was handled by Howard Shore who has sixty uh, hold on, oh, 82 movies as composer and yeah it includes the new crimes of the future not the old one or possibly not the old one anyway that one maps to the stars cosmopolis a dangerous method eastern promises a history of violence spider existence crash M. Butterfly, Naked Lunch, Scanners, and The Brood. Oh, and The Fly. So, yeah, again, very comfortable working relationship they must have. That I did not mean to imitate Yoda's pattern of grammar. So, the... Yeah, the IMDb Parents Guide puts it really well. Intense synthetic music occurs throughout. So, critic quotes, chilling score by Howard Shore. Music and or score, 10 out of 10. I'm looking for more of Howard Shore's work after hearing the main theme. Howard Shore, a Cronenberg regulars, score is deeply haunting, while also with a degree of emotion, not just going for full-on horror, but also the emotional core. Adding to the film's depth is the mostly synthesizer score by Howard Shore, described by Woods as almost an electronic version of Bernard Herrmann, which, yeah, that is that is high praise. Bernard Herrmann was a genius. Let's see. Almost is the key word here because Shore's often morbid musical strains fall, unlike most of Herrmann's, somewhere between tonality, via which most... Most people in the Western world still measure their sense of musical reality and atonality. The principal timbers are a synthesized string orchestra and a synthesized church organ, the latter often playing simple but dissonant intervals in unison. But there is one extended quasi strings cue, which I would label a rhapsody, heard initially during a specific sequence, and then returning. Uh, let's see. Right returning behind the end titles that drones its way slowly and very sadly through minimally ble minim minimally shifting harmonies that seem to extend out and beyond that extraordinarily bleak horizon we see in the last. Uh, was, uh, yeah, we see at one point in the movie. The score for Videodrome was provided by another of Cronenberg's longtime collaborators, composer Howard Shore, who in addition to scoring everything from The Brood to Cosmopolis for Cronenberg, also did the music for tons of Hollywood blockbusters, including the Lord of the Rings movies. Shore's music is every bit as bizarre as the film, starting out as traditional orchestral film music and devolving into electronically synthesized pieces that perfectly echo, echo the... I, uh, I'm not going to give that away. Shore's soundtrack mirrors the technological mistrust that is a theme of the film. Like Cronenberg, Shore is a pro, and Videodrome's music remains a groundbreaking and influential composition. 
and uh, Howard Shore provides us with an eerie score that has lots, lots of synthesizers as usual. Also, there are these organ pieces which cast everything in such an ominous tone. And let's see the yeah, there's also really great sound design, which is extremely important for the the practical effects. Otherwise, we just don't buy it. And let's see. And right, the yeah, the movie is fairly short. That's because the plot moves so fast, yet without you losing track of what's going on. And critic quotes, speaking of best. Cronenberg's Videodrome moves slow like a freight train out of the station, building speed and power going faster and faster until the end comes racing toward you with full whistles blowing. And yeah, without end credits, this movie is an hour and 21 and a half minutes long, and with them is only an hour and 24 minutes long. So yeah, and you know, yeah, if, if the first 30 minutes of it don't really hook you. I'm not sure there's really going to be anything in the rest of the movie that will. And yeah, so yeah, the the best element, you know, tied between the exploration of themes and the practical effects. And this is where I'm supposed to talk about the worst aspect. I'm not sure. I mean, again, that kind of means that there's a bad aspect to this. I am not yeah, I don't I don't think I have any. Um yeah, so one thing I saw a number of other people saying was the worst aspect is they felt it was overrated and you know, yeah, like I said, it's not for everyone. And yeah, I would I was most worried that it would be too weird, too hard to follow and just get lost in itself. I was most looking forward to the exploration of themes, and the movie exceeded my expectations. Now, the the trailer gives a little too much away, I would say, and this is the kind of thing where, like, you know, the trailer's fine. It's definitely a curious, you know, yeah. This is not really a movie. I, I, you know, they didn't know how to advertise it, which is why the trailer is as off from the. I, I don't just mean like odd for you know. I, I get that. You know, considering oh, it's about technology, and it's a 1980s film, early 1980s film. So of course the trailer, you know, yeah, I, I, I get why it looks like it looks based on genre and and when it was released, but this is definitely a case where they did not know how to advertise it, and I get that. I, I don't know, I'm not sure how you do a, a trailer for this that doesn't give too much away and isn't, yeah, it's, just, it's, it's really difficult to make a trailer for this. Now, some of the covers and posters do give too much away, not all of them, and certainly some of the covers and posters give you a good idea of what the movie is like. Now, that brings us to the Rotten Tomatoes. So this has a 79 on the tomato meter based on 52 reviews. 41 of them are fresh and an 80% audience score based on over 25,000 ratings. The consensus by critics Visually audacious, disorienting, and just plain weird, Videodrome's musings on technology, entertainment, and politics still feel fresh today. And, yeah, so the average critic rating was 7.40 out of 10. And the, yeah, 80% that of, 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 of audiences, that's how many out of 100 rated it 3.5 stars or higher, the average rating was 3.9 out of 5, and the movie is certified fresh. Now, 
did I ruin is is it that it's not on Metacritic? I'm just gonna do a really quick search to make sure it, uh, I guess I just forgot to copy it in. Okay. Well if it will here we go. Yes. So the yeah, on Metacritic, it has a 60 out of hundred based on six critic reviews. Four of them are positive, one is mixed, one is negative. 5.2 out of 10 for users with uh, 140 ratings total, 72 positive, 18 mixed, 50 negative. So yeah, the and let's see the reviews number at 19. So yeah, the Yeah, just as a very quick yeah, so there's one person who says that it get it goes too far in what it shows. There's one person who said it's weird, don't use your logic. The story doesn't make sense, is ridiculous. Only the beginning was a bit interesting. The gore and visual effects are outdated. Wow. I mean, like, I guess I can think of one or two that that's kind of true of, but the effects hold up incredible. And there's one that is, I think it's French, so I'm just going to do a very quick... It's, uh, hmm. Does it? Okay, so the. Yeah, so, so the. This person said, you know, okay, it's, you know, the, the effects. Let's see. Yeah, the, the gore and such are, you know, that's, yeah, that's impressive, and, let's see, uh, he hadn't managed at the time to get his head out of his ass, David Cronenberg, hence his unappetizing hodgepodge as a film, incoherent, completely crazy, in very bad taste, and, even after several beers, he didn't find it funny, I don't know. Maybe that's a maybe that's a language barrier thing. Yeah, it's not. It's not funny. It's not meant to be funny. So there are only three hundred and three user reviews on IMDb, and yeah, uh, usually I just read the ones the the top voted one hundred. But when there's that few, yeah, I, I read all of them, and yeah, that's definitely where you see it is not a film for everyone. And there were 149 links in the external MDB external reviews section. A hundred of them worked and were in English. And that brings us to the awards. Let's see. So it won three, was nominated for seven. And let's see. Yeah, so it won Best Science Fiction Film at the Brussels uh, uh, Biff. And it was tied with Bloodbath at the House of Death. And it won the Canadian Society of Cinematographers Awards, 1984. Best Cinematography and Theatrical Feature, Mark Irwin. And that makes a lot of sense. It's impeccably shot. And it won a Genie for Best Achievement in Direction, tied with Bob Clark and Christmas Story. And it was nominated for Best Performance by an Actress in a Supporting Role, Sonia Smits. Best Performance by an Actor in a Supporting Role, Leslie Carlson. Best Performance by an Actor in a Supporting Role, Peter Dvorsky. Best Screenplay, Best Achievement in Cinematography, Best Achievement in Art Direction, Best Achievement in Film Editing. But it did not win the... Uh, yeah. It was nominated for most reasons. Yeah, so this has a 7.2 on IMDb. Based on 90,994 IMDb users, so the 26.7% gave it a 7, 25% gave it an 8, 11.7 gave it 9, 10.5 gave it 10, 13.9 gave it 6, 
six percent gave it five, two point eight gave it four, and the votes for three, two, and one are around a percent each, percent and a half. And yeah, so the yeah, I will get into the details of the special effects in the spoiler sections, but it is impossible for me to get into them without spoilers. So for now, I will say the effects are amazing. And yeah, some critic quotes. Rick Baker does the effects known for American Werewolf in London, which he also did an incredible job on. The effects aren't quite as good as The Thing, but they're still amazing. Baker makes uh, I see, yeah, Baker makes bodies grotesque. You have to see Baker's effects to believe how creative and gruesome they really get. As usual, because it's Cronenberg, there's body horror to be had. The effects on prosthetics were way ahead of their time and look amazing even today. An all-time favorite of mine, signature Cronenberg body horror oozes from the screen and evokes a domestic transposition of H.R. Geiger. The best, uh, uh, right. the best example of biomechanical grotesquerie next to Naked Lunch, Videodrome leaves the screen pulsating and inflamed while burying into your brain. Effects 10 out of 10. Rick Baker, involved in American Werewolf, makes part of the of a uniquely creative team state-of-the-art repellent Rick Baker special effects there are instances of delectable Gru and Baker's special effects are truly ahead of their time but the thing that Cronenberg manages so effortlessly is to punctuate rather than pummel when necessitated his eye for gruesome detail in Baker's deft hand make a most formidable pairing but he prefer prefers to restock his reserves before plundering or fraying senses once more. And that's very true. I I had actually forgotten this really because when you when you just like sit down and think about this movie and focus on all the effects, like there's there's a lot of them. But yeah, they really don't overdo and that is kind of like I I've seen people argue that Cronenberg goes too far with the fly. It it and that definitely I don't know if I agree with that because it does have the intended effect it's supposed to be extremely off-putting but in that movie he really does go very very far and you know but but yeah in this it's it's really and and I'm not saying I'm not criticizing the fly for that I'm saying it works what he did in both works for the movies because the fly is supposed to be just this horrifying you know body changing kind of thing and here it is supposed to be this more gradual thing and it just it works incredibly well so yeah I it's it's very impressive how he managed to spread out the effects and violence over the court like as I said you know it was 81 and a half I think it's just double check to make sure I get it 81 and a half minutes he manages to spread out the violence so that it's not like non violence and, and special effects so that it's not like non-stop hammering and also have like yeah just it's it's yeah I'll I'll get more into it in, in the spoiler section. Videodrome unites a wonderful cast, some of the best special effects of the early 80s. The effects are very memorable and they were produced by effects wizard Rick Baker. And the effects are occasionally gruesome, but wondrously tactile in the pre-CG era for which many of us are now nostalgic. This and John Carpenter's The Thing demonstrate how creative effects artists could be without relying upon computer graphics. And yeah, I, I have to admit, I've seen a bunch of horror movies with CG. I'm not sure I've seen CG that outdoes this kind of creative thing. I'm, I'm not saying that CG, sometimes CG is amazing, but... When it comes to gore, I think if you at all can, you should use practical effects. It just, like, I know, it's still fake, it's not real still, but there's this, like, you can tell that there's something there. There's not this sort of weightless quality that there sometimes is with, with CG. And and to be fair, there you know, at times you can also... You know, like like I said, I'd, I'd say there's maybe two effects where 
at least part of the effect. You can see how they did it. You can kind of, you know, figure out. And, and you know, I've never found that it took me out of the movie, but, you know, some people will have that experience. This movie's effects are great. We get a whole slew of awesome practical effects courtesy of Rick Baker, and while they... Yeah, there's sometimes you can say, okay, that's, that's latex. And let's see... They make an already great film better. Groundbreaking effects. Rick Baker is the talented mastermind behind the disturbing special effects, and even by today's standards, they're phenomenal. Cronenberg uses this imagery not only to shock his audience, but to reveal. With excellent makeup special effects by Rick Baker, and who remains timely, gets five shriek girls. That's that critic's rating. I forget. I think that might be a five out of five. I should have written that down. Baker is truly one of a dying breed. Those who are capable of bringing to life horror with their hands and making it real. Let's see. Yeah, so, on the, on the violence specifically, like Brazil or Twelve Monkeys, this movie will make you think. I don't see any way... Uh, right, and these are still critic quotes. I don't see any way that any discussion of the video drone can begin without getting the gory effects out of the way, they do look great and add texture to the film. Cronenberg has a knack of adding gore in the right places. That is what separates his gore from the gore of other directors. Any director can add gore to his films, but only a truly great director knows where to place the gore and how to build up to it. Cronenberg loves lulling his audience into a false sense of security and then assaulting you with something gory. If you're looking to attack the audience with gore and are using it right, all that leaves is the look of the gore. Rick Baker layers the gory effects, making sure they are deep and aren't lame, but are actually really good looking. And let's see. Now that is So, the, let's see, yeah, so some written reviews that I recommend, did I ask, I just, I gotta double check real quick, sounds a little off, but was there actually, Okay, um, I guess maybe the, Okay, I'm going to have to skip that section anyway. Okay, that... Yeah, so... I recommend this to anyone who likes watching a movie and really thinking about it, diving deep into understanding what the... what it's saying. And... Yeah, so I only have the, the very bare bones DVD. It has the, the trailer, which you can also find online. So I can't really speak to whether it's worth owning a, you, you know, your own copy. And yeah, depending on country, you can stream this on Prime Video, Microsoft Store, Google Play, iTunes, or Vudu. And yeah, so... I rate this 10 body horror nightmare fuel physical changes out of 10. And yeah, uh, I could I could watch this, you know, yeah, I could, I could sit down and watch it again right after I'm done recording this. And actually, I just remembered I forgot to mention the last viewing was right before I hit record. So 
yeah, it's just, it's it's amazing. I, I think I'm going to try to find some excuse to watch it again soon. Anyway, now the, yeah, so the ranking, worst to best of all the Cronenberg movies that I've watched, keeping in mind, I love all of them. They're all amazing. I'm ranking how much I love them, not whether or not I love them all. Brood, The Brood, The Dead Zone, Naked Lunch, Eastern Promises, Scanners, Spider, History, A History of Violence, Dangerous Method, Existence, The Fly, and Videodrome. So, yeah, my my favorite of the... Yeah. Which you might have, have, have guessed by how many positive things I've said about it and how positive those things have been. So, that brings us to the... Let's see the the thoughts section so from here on out spoiler for the movie notes taken while watching so the rest of this video is not a review it's a series of well thoughts some of it is analysis some of it is MST theory, riff tracks and other jokes and the yeah the time codes for all the sections are in the description box so this first section it's thoughts that I had while watching chronological order you can think of it as a running commentary live tweeting and the like and the section after that is thoughts I had before watching. So most of the analysis and deep stuff will be in the next thought section. So, you know, if you want to skip, that's perfectly okay. And, yeah, we see at the start, you know, Max looks at stills from pornos while eating, whilst eating leftover pizza. Obviously, eating is for sustenance. Looking at these stills has become such a regular part of his job that he eats during it. You know, it, I mean, at least if it was some sort of erotic food. But, no, this, and, and it's clear, like, he's just gotten the, the wake-up call. So, no, no, he's, he's going to work. You know, he's not going to, like... Stay home and masturbate, or go find a, a prostitute, or something. No, he's he's looking at these porn of stuff. The, there's even the detail that he, you know, as he he eats the the pizza slice. There's a little bit of of um, ah, what's it called? Like t tomato, you know, yeah, from from the from the pizza that leaves a mark on one of the one of the pictures. That's you know, he's he's so desensitized to to this, you know. And Max and his two colleagues watch the softcore porn. Max thinks it's too soft. None of them appear to be aroused at all. You know, they're not... They've, they've seen so much of this stuff that it doesn't even... Yeah. And when Max sees Videodrome for the first time, he doesn't appear to feel any empathy for the woman. He's just fascinated. You know, he's like, wow, how did they do this? He's not like, um... Is she okay? Because that looks very real. And, you know, Max and we learned that Nikki is into S&M and, you know, a, she had a guy cut her, you know, into her, her shoulder, uh, not, not sure, yeah, the part between her shoulder and her neck, you know, and like, at f yeah, you know, at first it's just this thing of, you know, she says, take, take a Swiss army knife and cut me right here. And he's like, looks like somebody beat me to it. You know, that's, that's, he's, he's so desensitized that, you know, that request doesn't, like, he, he ends up not doing it. He's not, he doesn't appear to be comfortable cutting her. But he's, you know, he starts by joking. You know, it's, it's, yeah, like, you know, a, a fairly, it might be a normal question to ask in this circumstance is, are you sure you're okay with this? Is is someone hurting you, you know, against your will, this kind of thing? And, you know, after the, the joke, he does still come back and say, wait, you let a guy cut you? Why, why, why did he cut you again? So, something like that. You know, he, he can't completely, you know, that is like he's, despite how desensitized he is, and I, I don't think he would care about this if he wasn't interested in Nikki. And, yeah, you know, the, the piercing Nikki's ears leads directly into sex. It's not that, you know, the, the, there's a very clear, very distinct, the, the ah, what's the word? For her, pain and, and being physically hurt, you know, turns her on. 
it, it's it's very clear. You know, the movie makes completely clear, and that's also that's something that bothers some people. You know, some some. You know, th there have been a lot of unnuanced uh, depictions of S and M in in you know American movies and TV, and here we actually have one that understands. No, they they feel sexual arousal from. Uh, I hope I don't sound like I'm judging. I'm I'm trying to keep. I'm trying to analyze it. Not not. I, I'm not gonna get into. You know anything personal here I'm just I'm but I don't judge anyone you know uh, I've always said when it comes to sex the only thing that matters is consent keeping in mind if you're under the age of consent you by definition cannot consent and that's it you know and the the yeah so the the um, yes you know clearly it's not just that she likes sex and she likes pain. No, pain makes her think of sex. You know, it is this very clear, and that's definitely something that some people could not handle. You know, thinking about that. You know, when they when they watch this, and you know, I mean, today we've come so far that you have the the Fifty Shades movies, which I hear are terrible, and I haven't watched them. I do recommend uh, Dan Olson, Folding Ideas, did some really great videos on, on all three of the movies. But, yeah, you know, today you can put a movie in theaters that has it, you know, t uh, presented as something that's actually erotic, which in this movie it's not supposed to be erotic. We, we understand that for her it is. But, you know, he's at least somewhat uncomfortable with it, and there's not really, you know, yeah, it's not supposed to be erotic for for the viewer and but but yeah you know piercing Nikki's ears leads directly to the sex and then they're on the video drum set and it's the, the, the first hallucination and you know and and yeah you know they started at, she finds the tape and says that she likes it and so you know yeah imagining that they are on the video drum set is a fairly logical um, next step of that for them. And, uh, you know, M Marcia transitions very smoothly. You know, when she first hears the description of Videodrome, she says, you know, and, and um, Max, uh, you know, first he describes it, and then he says, I think it's the next big thing, or I think it's the future. And then she says, God help us all. And then, you know, like less than a minute later, she she agrees to, to try to find Videodrome. And yeah, when when Nikki says she's gonna audition for Videodrome, you know, he you know, at first Max jokes, no one on earth was made for that show. And then he does snap out of his cool demeanor and say, I don't want you going. This is this is they play rough rougher than Nikki Brand can handle. And, you know, she tries to disprove him by burning her own flesh with, with the cigarette, you know. And that was, that was why she asked for a cigarette. It wasn't that she might receive some pleasure from smoking, which I, I believe we see her do it at least one point in the movie. It was so that she could gain pleasure from the cigarette by burning her, her you know, yeah. And, and it's like... Isn't it on the on the chest? Like, yeah, that's it's a fairly. We have a lot of nerve endings in in that. You know, there there are parts of the human body where you don't necessarily feel a lot of pain. You know, but yeah, it's. And Bianca Oblivion says that what Max said on the show was superficial, a hint that you know. Th she maybe she has a philosophy. She's involved with video drum. <clears throat> and Max hallucinates slapping Bridie and she turns into Nikki briefly and then he you know, she says, You didn't you didn't hit me and he says, No no no, no I, I know I didn't hit you. I mean And in a world of people who've long since stopped caring, people who feign empathy, if they even bother to do that. You know, Bridie does clearly actually worry about Max. 
and it is legitimately shocking when the cassette breathes and moans like a woman. And yeah, so 33 minutes in, Max sees Brian Oblivion talking to him through the television and he explains the hallucinations. And it is, it's legitimately chilling how calm Brian is as he's being tied down. You know, he's, he's already sitting on the chair. But the, the, this, you know, yeah, the, the executioner that turns out to be Nikki comes in and, you know, at, at first he's just, he's resting his, his hands on the, on the, what do they call, like chair, uh, yeah, I think you know what I mean. And then when, when the executioner comes in to tie, you know, he gently lifts his hand a little and then, you know, so that the rope can come on. And he does this with both hands completely without any, yeah, you know, I, I, Honestly, it seems like he's a little... The only thing that seems to legitimately concern him is that he might not be able to finish his sentence before he has been strangled to death. That's, that is the thing. That's, the, that's, that's it. The, other than that, he accepts his death. At this, you know, And this is already shocking. And then we see that it's Nikki who's the executioner, and it leads directly into... You know, she she seduces Max, and the television reacts like an aroused body, and just, yeah, you know, the this. There are a lot of times in this movie where, pain, leads into sex, or the or we we become aware of someone's pain. You know, before Max looks at the the porn in the in the hotel where he can hear a woman screaming. Yeah, he hears a woman screaming, and it's not a. It that is not a scream of pleasure. That is not. She. It. It sounds like she's being hit by her partner or something, you know. And right after that, the 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 the, the sex, the the tape. And yeah, again with with oblivion being being strangled. Also, be, you know, be, and between those two, you have the ear piercing leading into the the sex. And it's also great that they, they're they both naked and they're in a position where it looks like they're about to have sex. And it does also lead into sex. But before they have sex, he pierces not one, but both of her ears. You know, that's it's almost like, for her, that's foreplay. And Bianca thought Max was there to hurt her, so she showed him the tape with teeth, which, you know, she later says with teeth, regrets it when she realized that he isn't, and then later he is there to kill her. So basically, she realized that it would be him. She was just too early on the, yeah. And she explains about her father's tapes being all that's left. Brian believed that the signals caused the tumor. She thinks it's the other way around. And I really love that the movie never says which is correct because it uh, it almost has to be one or the other you know if if there's no yeah but yeah which which is it does it hurt you to watch violence and and sex and this kind of thing or is there something in you that makes you want to see those things you know it's yeah or or in that regard, maybe it's a mix of, of the, yeah. And we see the hallucination recorder, and it legitimately is just, like, the the look of this thing is just, yeah, amazing. And, you know, he wakes up in bed, and, and that's another great thing, you know, the, the, actually, yeah, this time it's not even sex, it's, it's a whipping in place of sex. And, you know, at first, Max is very timid with the whipping, and then he starts being into it. And at first, like, we hear Nikki moan, but then we see on the TV that it's Marsha being whipped. And, you know, and, and yeah, it must be horrifying to wake up in bed with a corpse. And, and in, in the... I forget where, but but Cronenberg said something like, you know, a lot of people have the experience of waking up in bed with someone that they don't remember getting into bed with, and he wanted to, you know, yeah. So it's a it's a take off that, a take on anyway. 
but but yeah, you know, it it's the the hallucination, and it's also you know, okay, so we've gotten a couple of POV shots. He holds his hands up and looks at them, you know, and then he no longer has it on. He he feels for it, and it's like okay, hallucination. You know, that's one of the times in the movie where we're sure okay, this is this is hallucination. He's suddenly on the on the video drone set, and he's whipping a TV, and you know, okay, this is hallucination. But then when you know what happened how did he go from a hallucination and with the recorder on his face to suddenly waking up in bed and the woman that's dead in bed with him is Marsha and and you can see from her you can see on her back she has marks from being whipped you know so yeah just I yeah I'll get more into that in the in the next section and Harlan reveals he's been lying to Max working for Barry Barry accuses Max of enjoying this violence Harlan says Americans getting America is getting soft they have to get tough they have to get rid of the weaker elements it sounds a lot like fascist ideology the pistol becoming part of him is so messed up I do kind of wish when we first see the the hand and and the the uh, tendrils I guess growing from from the tips of his fingers to, uh, and um, you know, into into his flesh, <clears throat> and I th do they also go through the gun? Um, anyway, you know, I kind of wish they didn't show the the fingers as the tendrils are are growing out. I appreciate that is part of the point. It's it's important that you know this this thing of you know he's the, uh, the um, he is he is becoming this. You know, the, the, the weapon is no longer distinct from him. He is becoming the weapon. I, I you know, it, the, yeah, it's the only part of the effect that isn't completely convincing. Other than that, it looks great. But, but you, you know, that, yeah, the fingernails and the fingertips just, they didn't completely have, today they would be able to. I've, I've seen practical effects from more recent movies where they, they can recreate a hand completely credibly. It looks great once it's his actual hand with prosthetics. I kind of wish that was the first time that we saw the fingers themselves. Maybe, maybe if they showed just the tendrils growing out and and going into his his hand, and then afterwards showing, yeah. And it's such a nasty flesh gun when Max goes to kill Bianca and Max Max yeah, the Max attack. Max attacks Harlan with the flesh tape, and we see the the gun now fires cancer. Even on the derelict ship, there's a TV. You know, everywhere, the the and and the you know the guy instead of like a dancing monkey or something, he has a TV, and he begs for quarters for the battery for the TV. And yeah, you know, it is true. Our images do live on long after we die if we appear in a movie or TV show, if, if we have been filmed and that has been saved. Back when this came out, it was VCR, then it was DVD, now it's streaming. Right now, I could go put in my DVD of the 1932 Scarface. Every single person who appears in it is dead now. I think all the, all the people in the crew as well, uh, uh, that's... Not part of the point I was trying to make. Anyway, yeah, you know, I and I can see them, and like, I mean, children have to learn. No, 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 what you see on the screen isn't real. It's not right now, and it's not, you know, it can't come out and hurt you. And and you know, early on, people also like some people ran from a from a theater because the train moved directly towards the camera, and the people assumed, oh, the train's gonna hit us. We have to get out of here, you know. So, yeah. You know, in a way, it you know it keeps the dead alive, and it's such it's such a great reveal when Bianca said, you know, this is all that's left of my father. He filmed thousands of tapes, sometimes three or four in a day, and that brings us to the final section. Here we go, and. Notes taken before watching. So, right, the, the, let's 
the the um yeah three different and according this is from Wikipedia. Three different endings were filmed. The ending used in the final film, where Max shoots himself on the derelict ship, was James Wood's idea. One of the initial intentions for the ending was to include an epilogue after the suicide, wherein Max, Bianca, and Nikki appear on the set of Videodrome. Bianca and Nikki are shown to have chest slits like Max, from which grotesque mutated sex organs emerge. Kronberg described his original vision of the ending as follows. After the suicide, Max ends up on the video drone set with Nikki hugging and kissing and neat stuff like that. Happy ending? Well, it's my version of a happy ending. Boy meets girl on the video drone set with the clay wall maybe covered in blood, but I'm not sure. Freudian rebirth imagery, pure and simple. In his director's commentary for the Criterion Collection release of the film, Kronberg credited his decision to omit the epilogue, at least partially to his own atheist beliefs, as the apparent resurrection of Max and Nikki on the video drum set could be interpreted as having gone to an afterlife, whereas Cronenberg himself does not believe in one. That has intense anti-theist energy. Trust me, I used to be an anti-theist, which, for those not in the know, is the aggressive kind of atheist. I'm a lot calmer of an atheist now, and I focus more on secularism than atheism. I'd rather people think that I did believe in God and just wanted to keep religion and government separate, then people think that I care more about belief than secularism. So, yeah, the, the, with that out of the way, back to the quote. He's not just worried that people would read it as an afterlife. He's worried that people would think that he himself believed in an afterlife. I guess maybe he was very concerned that he would start getting fan mail from religious people. Like, he's like, now here's a movie where a guy fucks his TV set, sticks a pistol into his stomach later, later retrieves it, it fuses to his hand, also his stomach is a vagina video cassette player. These are things I think up, and put then put on a massive screen for the world. So, you know, spending these, what, $5.9 million for it. But I'm not a believer in afterlife. Definitely do not think that about me. And let's see the yeah I think the the alternate versions is worth reading on on IMDb is worth reading and let's see the Right, so some critic quotes. Every idealist in the movie ends up dead. And, yeah, you know, uh, Nikki and Max have sex while a man is being tortured in the background. It's even more relevant today. It predicted how addicted we are to our smartphones. And it's very true. Like, absolutely. People watched a huge amount of television in the 1980s and today but today like you can hardly get someone to put down their smartphone and I you know I'm not above it myself I have mine right here now what I say is you know the, what I what I tell myself is I need it to be close by because there's an app on it that predict that that will give me a notification if there is a lightning strike in uh, what was it? I think 20 miles from where I am so that I have time to turn off and unplug my PC because if the lightning strikes extremely close it can ruin my my computer but I don't need to keep it as close to me at all times as I do you know so yeah at the start of the movie the lead claims the TV is a safe way to experience sex and violence not long after that he is definitively disproven, but he still continues. It's like he can't stop. The potentially dangerous Oculus Rift looking thing... Er, right. He even allows the potentially dangerous Oculus Rift looking thing from a guy he only just met. You know, but he's told, you know, th this is about the, the hallucinations, you know, and at that point he does believe that Barry is trying to help him with, with that, but it's still, you know, and he's just been told, oh yeah, we make, what was it, uh, uh, missile guidance systems for, for NATO, you know, it's, yeah, and 
you can read the entire movie as all being hallucination. Cronenberg only writes at night using his nightmares. The scary thing about dreams is not that something scary happens, it's that it starts out normal. And that's such a... I love that about this movie because that really is it. Like, there's so many movies where something scary happens and, you know, some of them explain, some of them don't. But here, it starts out normal. Like, Max is just watching a, a tape of, you know, he, he thinks, oh, it's like, a, it's a sermon. You know, he's basically going to explain about the, the video drone thing. I'm interested in finding out more. I guess I'm going to sit down and listen to this old guy ramble on. And suddenly he's talking directly to Max and, like, respond, you know, it's a conversation suddenly. And, yeah, you know, there is a certain dreamlike logic to that. You know, that's the kind of thing that you really only see in dreams and, and movies that are that use dream logic or you know use hallucinations or things like that it it's not you know you never see that in a horror movie that is where, where you're supposed to believe everything you see and I, i'm not saying that those you know the, some of those are also amazing you know once again you know the fly the thing you know these are movies that aren't really about hallucinating but they're still incredibly scary I'm, I'm not saying I'm only scared about that. Now, right, some, some say, I wish the movie had not waited until the 45 minute mark for the hand to turn into a gun. I think that's why the ending feels so rushed. He decided he's going to kill these various people. He does it in a few minutes. It's inconsistent whether or not his hand just permanently holds a gun. People react as if his hands, as if his hand is always a gun some of the time. And he goes and shoots his boss and then has to hide his hand in his coat. Also, people do panic when they hear the gunshots, but then he's still easily able to leave. I do like the twist. You wonder how Harlan didn't start hallucinating. And then it's revealed that he was showing Max videotapes. He was working with the bad guy. At the end of the movie, the gun shoots cancer rather than bullets. I believe it may be the same technology later used on those windmills that Trump is always talking about that cause cancer with noise. I, th I think I probably made the following joke at some point in a video, but I still, just to make sure, I have to wonder if Trump watches Greystill Place, because Greystill Place definitely has, like, holy crap, that guy gets in a lot of trouble with, with windmills in, in his videos. Seriously, though, he's, he's awesome. And definitely check out his videos. And, yeah, some critics say it's too confusing. Near the end, I didn't know if people were seeing the same hallucinations as Max is. That is for sure. Like, it is not clear whether the cancer gun is a hallucination. Like, it, it almost has to be a hallucination, you know? Because, like, guns don't fire cancer. That's not a thing that can, you know, even if you want to say, oh, but it's a it's a videodrome gun, and videodrome causes tumors in your head. So, if you shoot something, you know, but... It's it's still like you know I, I mean you'd you'd certainly think that there would have to be more than just this regular gun like he's not handed some sci-fi gun that you know yeah maybe it is hallucination but maybe you know maybe reality is being altered a lot of explanations are just one line of exposition with no resolution. And I don't think that's a problem. I forget if that critic did think. I, I can imagine they, that that sounds like a criticism. Nikki Brand gives Max his awakening, leading to him move, to move past only watching the sex and violence and start causing it. By the end, it's hard to tell who the bad guys are, which, again, I think that might have been a criticism. I think that's great. I love that we legitimately don't... Yeah, like... Is Bianca actually a bad guy? Because she sends him out to kill just, like, Barry did, you know, or is it only that, well, I mean, she sends him to kill people that sent him to kill people, so maybe, and, you know, certainly it appears to be, in part, like, self-preservation, self-defense, because he just, you know, she tells him to go kill people right after he has tried to kill her. 
when Nikki and Max are watching the torture porn, he's the one who's about to turn off. She's the one who wants to keep watching, the opposite of what you might expect for gender roles. And when they're on TV, she admits that she herself intentionally stimulates others, which is, again, something that, you know, ah, oh, you're not allowed to do that. You're not a good girl if you stimulate others. And the Videodrome leader thinks that Videodrome will cull the weak, but Bianca Oblivion believes it is the next step in human evolution. And we're basically left, you know, trying to figure out, well, which, which is it, you know? And that certainly, I mean, if, if Max can cause cancer with a, a regular gun, you know, is that the next step in human evolution? You know, it's, it's certainly, like, it's, it's substantially more effective, and essentially a gun is... A result of human evolution it's our brains you know that's why we're so that's why we're at the top of the food chain you know lots of animals use tools but we build tools that are much more effective than like stakes and rocks and such so you know maybe maybe this part and and they did say it you know it affects the brain it causes brain tumors now and yeah, Max commits suicide, hoping to ascend to another plane of existence. I do, you know, I, I jest, but I do legitimately love that we don't see what happens afterwards. Because it is this thing, you know, the last time we saw Bianca... Uh, ah, the last time we saw Nikki, Bianca revealed that they were, you know, Videodrome used her image after killing her to get him to, to kill for them. And then Nikki shows up on the television again, and it's like, I mean, Barry's dead. Would Bianca really use Nikki's image? She's the one who revealed that Nikki was dead and that her image was being used. You know, so so it's like, who is doing this? And and are they? Is it because they want to get rid of him because they don't need him anymore? You know, maybe. I, I mean, certainly if Barry still has any. If if Barry wasn't the only person for for uh, spectac yeah spectacular opticals, maybe someone else working you know at the top. I mean, not you know obviously they have employees. Someone else at the top is the one who who you know did this so that they so that they aren't attacked by Max. Maybe it's Bianca. She talks about you know it's the next step in human evolution. You have to, you know, so I I love that we have no idea if what happens at the end, because it really is, you know, that, that was the thing, that the, the score, I want to very briefly, yeah, um, there is one extended quasi-strings cue, which I would label a rhapsody heard initially during the first lovemaking sequence, and then returning behind the end titles that drones its way slowly and very sadly through minimally shifting harmonies that seem to extend out and beyond that extraordinarily bleak horizon we see in the last sequence. And it is true, like, maybe, you know, like, does that... it Again, it heard initially during the first lovemaking sequence, so is he reuniting with Nikki? You know, that's, that's typically... If you use a light motif, you're implying that there is a connection or a melding or, you know. So maybe that is what it is. And it's just, I love when a movie understands, the, the people making a movie understand, you can do something with the music that plays over the end credits. You can. It doesn't have to be just filler as people file out of the, the movie theater. And here, like, he didn't write another one. You know, there's a there's a a lot of score for this movie, and they chose. I I don't know if it was his decision or or uh, Cronenberg's, but one of them chose to reuse that particular piece of music. I want to say want to see if I very quickly can find. So the let's see the. Uh right right yeah the uh, uh, at least. I don't know if this is the full, but at least a, a chunk of the of the soundtrack is free on YouTube, and I'm just going to see if I really quickly can add up, so let's see, that's... Uh, 
uh, I guess 46 and yeah, 46 and a half minutes of, of score is on YouTube. It's possible there's more than that, but there's at least that much. Yeah, they could have found another piece of of score to, to use there, you know, but no, it, it implies maybe there is this, you know, maybe they're reunited on in, in some way, maybe not in afterlife, but, you know, Maybe it's just that both of them were killed by Videodrome after they served their their purpose. I mean, yeah, maybe maybe Max is gonna be used after the events of the movie by Videodrome to compel someone else into sex and violence. Now, some people criticize that Max. Max touches the weird scar in his stomach, but honestly, who hasn't touched an injury or scar? For example, if you get a cut inside your mouth, you run your tongue against it over and over. Early in the film, Mark, Mark, nah, Max starts to lose track of fantasy and reality, then starts creating reality from fantasy. That is the horror of the film. And it's, yeah. Uh, throughout the film, we see technology fuse with Max's body. Cronenberg has said that since he sees technology as an extension of the human body, it only seems fit that the chickens should come home to roost. And yeah, again, you know, like I, I just talked about, you know, it, it is essentially an extension of the human body because we made it. We didn't find it. We made it using our brains, our, our hands, you know, and, and tools that we made with our brain and hands. You know, it's not a lot, like it would be. It's different if you find like a uh, uh, sp uh, uh, spring. What are they called? Spring water? Uh, yeah, you know, if you find water naturally in in nature, you know that that's not. We didn't make that. That's you know, we we might affect it, but we didn't make that. But technology, all of technology was made by human brains and hands, and and you know. Yeah, using, sometimes using tools made by human brains and hands. Television does affect our perception. And let's see. He was, Kronberg was forced to cut all manner of berserk things from the script, like Max having a hand grenade for a hand, as well as him melting into Nikki as they kissed, and a total of five more characters dying of cancer. And any message or uh, let's see. any message or social comment the movie was trying to convey would occasionally be thrown to the back burner in favor of gore and mor morbidity. I don't agree with that. I would argue that the gore and morbidity always support the these these you know the the social commentary. You know, for example, this thing of, you know, he's becoming a weapon. It's no longer just that he can wield the weapon. He is, uh, you know, yeah. But, yeah, treats their own. And let's see. Let's see. Um, this isn't a normal horror movie, as it tries to scare you with the message that there's a serious fight going on between the powers that be for control of our minds, and we unwittingly have no say in the matter as long as we watch TV. And who's gonna stop? Like, I know some people have tried to, like, get away from, from civilization and such, but that's, like, statistically speaking, it's an extremely small number of people. And that is truly scary, hence it's a horror movie. And... Okay, I I think this is a, an okay, you know, yeah. So another critic said, It's alright, but the way Cronenberg makes metaphors literal comes off as cheesy, which isn't a good combo with how serious it's presented. This would have been interesting to see Sam Raimi adapt or John Carpenter. I would definitely, I mean, it's not going to happen today. It's, you know, I, I, I'm not sure John Carpenter's ever going to direct again. He's, I'm, I'm glad he's still making music. I think he did, did an incredible job uh, doing uh, the music for the new Halloween trilogy, the, the H40 trilogy. 
Sam Raimi, yeah, I mean, I don't know that we need another version of this, but you know, maybe, maybe not of a, like a remake or adaptation, maybe just like a spiritual successor and made by Sam Raimi, because you know, based on based on Doctor Strange 2, he still has some really, really terrifying, you know, yeah, he can he can still put together, you know, I, I know some people, you know, after they saw his uh, Oz movie, they were like, wow, what happened to Sam Raimi, you know, uh, but yeah, based on that, he still has some in him, some really, really terrifying images and creepy, uh, yeah. One of the biggest themes of the movie is TV as control. Those who control what's on TV control people. And... What a hellish nightmare it must be to hallucinate so intensely to the point where you can't tell what's real and what's not. And... The reason that both of the factions can manipulate Max so easily is he has no morals. He finds out that there's something seriously wrong with Videodrome, and he still wants to use it for ratings. One of the reasons that we can't tell what is hallucinated, what is hallucination and what is real, is that we're always seeing things from Max's point of view. He's an unreliable narrator. The hallucinations... Uh, yeah, the hallucinations are filmed the same way as the rest of the movie. I love when a director has the the guts to do this kind of thing and, and trusts the audience. I have previously praised the... the I, uh, technically, it wasn't... Christopher Nolan didn't invent it. He saw it in The Thin Red Line, which is also an excellent movie. But he really embraced the this idea of editing between flashback and present day without the the shimmer and without someone like you know without like a, a focus on the face of someone who's thinking back to them. just go directly from one to, to the next and it works incredibly well in the prestige it also i know i'm every i'm gonna get to be insufferable about this i i hope i'm not already the movie Martha Marcy May Marlene also uses it incredibly well. That is probably, if, if I had to say, if you're only going to watch one movie that does this, other than this movie, I would say Martha Marcy May Marlene. It's just, I, I absolutely love, because it really, that's, that's how she, she can't tell anymore. She can't tell the difference between what happened in you know in the cult what's happening now and what you know what is what is memory what is nightmare it's just yeah and yeah i i love that that cronenberg had the guts to to do this because it really is just yeah i'll i'll get more into it but i have some more critic quotes ah uh, let's see it is not merely that on the television screen entertainment is the metaphor for all discourse it is that off the screen the same metaphor prevails. As typography once dictated the style of conducting politics, religion, business, education, law, and other important social matters, television now takes commands. In courtrooms, classrooms, operating rooms, boardrooms, churches, and even airplanes, Americans no longer talk to each other, they entertain each other. They do not exchange ideas, they exchange images. They do not argue propositions, they argue with good looks, celebrities, and commercials. For the message of television as metaphor is not only that all the world is the stage, but that the stage is located in Las Vegas, Nevada. And... Cronenberg did well to name... Oh, right. Max is pulled out of his humdrum daily grind on the ass of the entertainment industry entertainment industry into a hallucinatory arena Cronenberg did well to name in Latin. Drome, from the ancient Greek dromos, meaning a race course or arena, which in its broadest sense, like the, equiv the English equivalent track, can also mean a road. Max's world becomes a stage, and he the main character, in a drama that begins with mystery, conspiracy, and double cross, only to end in volleys of cancer-causing bullets, new sex organs that double as VCRs, and a refutation of the false boundaries between hallucination and experience, reality and fantasy, mind-spirit 
and most importantly, flesh. And let's see. yeah, someone. Oh, right. Rick Baker seems to be challenging a contemporary Rob Bottin, and that's very true. There's, yeah, um, it's not an accident that I put the thing up there, and I realize it's so far away from the camera that if you don't know that's what you're looking at, you might you won't be able to recognize it. Network plus Brazil plus Clockwork Orange equals video drone. And yeah, one critic puts it the zero budget torture program. Today, the pirate footage now resembles Abu Ghraib. And let's see. Okay, there's a lot of. I'm gonna. Hmm. Yeah, I copied a whole lot of critic quotes. I am just going to skim the rest to... Yeah, uh, my back is not going to be able to stand me reading all of this. I'm just going to see where does it end. Okay, so... Okay, I'm just going to skin the rest of it. That won't take long. And I'm going to try to avoid any... Oh, wow. Yeah, there we go. So, I was going to say I was going to try to avoid dead air. Here we go. So, um, yeah, this is from the Frequently Asked Questions. The uh, Yeah, on IMDb. Actually, yeah, I'm just very briefly going to... Videodrome doesn't hit at instability in its final cut. It was Cronenberg's most imaginative, stylized, satirical, and disturbing film to date. But yeah, the uh, frequently asked, I'm to be frequently asked questions. Someone asked, at about an hour and 17 minutes in, when Max, Max's belly bites off Harlan's hand, what is that cylindrical nub on the end of Harlan's arm supposed to be? It looks like a soup can or soda can made of flesh. And someone answered, it looks like a type of hand grenade known as a potato masher. Now, turning a hand into a hand grenade is clever, but a lot of people don't recognize a potato masher on site. I think it would have been good if they used a pineapple grenade. You know, far more people know what those look like. But, you know, it's it's that thing, you know, occasionally Cronenberg will very much reveal that he is a Canadian. He doesn't always realize what an American audience, I think I'm just going to adjust this a tiny little bit, uh, what an, an American audience will recognize most or, or understand the best. You know, yeah, maybe, maybe um, Canadians do recognize potato magic. You know, I want to say it was like, the Germans, the, the Nazis used potato masher grenades, you know, where the, the pineapple grenade is like, I'm not sure Americans invented it, but I've seen it in a lot of American World War II movies used by the American forces. So the end of the movie, Max is temporarily a puppet for the Spectacular Optical Corporation, or SOC, a sock puppet, if you will. It is important to note that this movie is not actually saying that real in real life violent TV will lead to real life violence. I forget if I put it anywhere else, so I can briefly go into it here. It's kind of like the the yeah when he made this. A lot of people were criticizing movies like the ones that Cronenberg made for a lot of violence and sex and, you know, and basically one of the things that the, was, was argued was that people who watch a lot of this will stop being able to tell the difference between reality and fantasy, you know, they, they, you know, and it, it will hurt them, it will lead to them co committing real-life violence, and Cronenberg basically looked at that and was like, 
that's an interesting idea. Let's, you know, he, his movie is made from the perspective that that is a correct assessment that the critics have made. I kind of, like, think about how easy it would have been for him to, like, like if, if he wanted to do it the other way around. Uh, let's see. It could be something about, like, let's see. Yeah, yeah. The movie could have, like, people watching this violent stuff on TV. And then, like, you could have, like, an insert character for the critic come, you know, come and say, you can't watch that t TV violence. It'll, may it'll lead to real-life violence. And then, like, the person who's been watching the TV violence doesn't commit violence, but, like, a street criminal does commit violence. And maybe even towards the, the critic insert character. You know, if he wanted to be especially cheeky about it, he could have, like, the, the character who's been watching TV violence to, to look directly at the camera and say that's what they say better on tv than on the streets you know some but no he actually made a movie where it's completely true where where you know even if like a lot of you know ultimately i don't think we can know for sure what is uh, hallucination and what is real but i do th you know certainly the movie is uh, even if everything is a hallucination, that means that Max has lost his grip on reality from watching violence on TV, you know. So, it's, you know, it's either halluc either he halluc hallucinates violence or he commits violence, or maybe some of both. So, yeah, the movie is basically taking the critic's side and exploring that idea. That's, yeah, you know, it, it might seem like a, a troll, but I think it is... That he legitimately does think of, you know, I mean, that it is it is a potentially interesting idea, the the notion that, you know, and, and I've I believe by now, like they've done studies. I've heard that people who watch a lot of violence in you know, TV and, and movies, that they end up becoming desensitized. I'm not gonna sit, you know, I, I haven't read the study, I don't know, maybe it's true. I, all I can say is, it hasn't happened for me, so it mu it, it's not like a universal, I, 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 I can barely stand, like, real life violence. It's only the, the fake violence that, you know, yeah, sometimes I'll watch, uh, um, you know, yeah, sometimes I'll watch, like, a slasher movie and be like, oh, you know, okay, that's, you know, I, I won't, I'm not as shocked as I was the first time I, I watched slasher movies, you know. But as far as I understand, the study said, you know, no real life violence. Like people would, you know, hear about real life violence or see real, you know, when I when I see violence and it's been filmed, like I'm extremely uncomfortable if I'm not convinced that it's fake. If if I think there's even a chance that it's real, I can't watch it. Now. Videodrome is described by a character as nothing but sex and violence, no plot getting in the way. So I guess they invented slashers. I kid. I love slashers. So a lot of movies that have the main character hallucinate, you know, and, and where the viewer experiences the hallucination with the character, the, the, you know, the movie will, you know, reassuringly, after the hallucination, the, the movie will show the characters back where they physically were when the hallucination started, letting the audience know the hallucination is over. Yes, it did actually start, and, you know, the... the yeah, yeah, we saw it start. And on multiple occasions in this movie, we simply don't get that. Like, there'll be a scene where after a while, we as the viewer are convinced that at least some of what we're seeing has to be hallucination. It can't possibly be real life, but it's unclear where the hallucin hallucination started. And you know, like when when it ends, you know, are we are we sure like that the hallucination is over? The protagonist is not back in the physical location where the hallucination started, and at times it even forces us to consider maybe the hallucination started before we thought it did maybe something that looked normal was just a less extreme hallucination this is a movie that really does have you wondering what is hallucination and what is real life i if you know others please put it in the comments i have never seen a movie that that to this extent 
just like I I watch it I've watched it so many times and I can still I cannot say with certainty I, I can't point to anything in the movie and say with certainty that can't be a hallucination or this is definitely where a hallucination ended I one that I especially love is you know the the he gets the call and he goes to see Barry convex and Barry puts the thing on and he leaves and then Nikki you know and and the 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 whip and you know okay we accept the hallucination that started like okay yeah sure because he put the the thing on his head you know the the he yeah he was told just think about some violence you know violence and or sex something like that that'll trigger a hallucination you know and yeah okay he he feels his face no the box thing is no a hallucination gotcha and you know he's he's whipping and it sounds like Nikki but then we see it's actually Marsha and then he wakes up in his own bed and it's like I mean um, okay maybe maybe he fell unconscious and 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 then Barry returned to get the tape so he took the thing off his face and had the driver carry him to his apartment like even if the driver drops him off at the apartment like he has to go upstairs did he drag him all the way upstairs instead of just like saying okay uh, I guess you can sleep on the floor okay we'll get we'll get some kind of mattress and when he wakes up we'll tell him he has to go home but like carry him all the way up the stairs um, I guess get his keys out of his pocket that's really it's, it just gets creepier and creepier and, and more and more implausible. And then we realize he's not alone in bed. And the other person in bed is dead. A person that he knows personally. And the one that he it seemed like he was whipping. You know, at, at some point, he... Yeah, you know, he may be... And I get, yeah, that's, I guess, where he realizes he must have been whipping her because, like, again, like, just, just, let's walk, let's briefly walk through the alternative. Someone else whipped Marsha, killed her, and I guess dumped her next to Max in bed? That doesn't make any sense. You know, that's, like, okay, and then, like, left and somehow managed to lock the door behind them but Max still has the key like it just it doesn't make any sense the you know it's, it's like let's Occam's razor this thing he he must have he must have whipped her and killed her and then just like I mean does that mean that some part of him like why leave her there why not like some kind of like like I don't know drive to some place and try to dump the body or something did he leave her there because he wanted to have sex with the body or just you know that was unintentional I hope it didn't spook anyone I accidentally it was the it was the the keyboard for my the, the external battery driven keyboard for my my laptop that I accidentally knocked to the yeah I hit it from below so it went up in the air and then yeah anyway yeah I mean it, and and then and then Harlan comes and he's like there's nothing in your bed and then he goes in and he can't see Marcia there anymore so you know just yeah wh where did the where did the hallucination you know where did it end has it ended is he hallucinating Harlan and his own home right now you know it's just there's there's I really love that and it's also you know the the when when he watches the the Brian Oblivion tape you know he I mean the you know the tape bites that's got to be a hallucination and Brian talks directly to it. that has to be a hallucination. You know, we find out not long after that Brian has been dead for what was it, eleven months. You know, there's no way he he never even met Max. Max found out about him 
was you know a couple of days ago at the on the show you know so it's not like he could have he couldn't have recorded one where he said the name Max Ren and you know at first he just says hello Max but l a little later he says you Max Ren you know some something along those lines so it's just yeah he clearly and it's a conversation it's not he's not he's no longer just listening to Brian explaining things you know and yeah, you know, then that leads into the the sex with the TV, and uh, let's see the the yeah, and it's again, it's like where where did the like you know when, when he takes the tape back to Bianca, she says that she knew it was dangerous, you know, so some of it must not have been hallucinate or or did the tape induce hallucinate, you know, just yeah. Videodrome within the movie works incredibly well as a metaphor for the internet. And it really is impressive that Cronenberg came up with the concept so long before the internet became a reality. So again, you know, they they filmed this in 1981. Now, I'm just very briefly... The internet... Uh, let's see... Okay, so the... the Yeah, so the modern internet is the early 1990s. The, let's see, yeah, the origins date all the way back to packet switching and research commissioned by the U.S. Department of Defense in the 1960s to enable time sharing of computers. So, you know, yeah, they were, it was, it was, uh, let's see, and in the 80s, the funding of the National Science Foundation Network, backbone in the 1980s, as well as private funding for other commercial extensions, led to worldwide participation in the development of new networking technologies and the merger of many networks. So, uh, let's see, although the internet was widely used by academia in the 1980s, commercialization incorporated services, technologies into virtually every aspect of modern life. And yeah, you know, so... He ba he probably knew that something like this was coming, but predicting how big of a part of our lives it would become is, yeah. In part, it's about the interactivity. It's not enough to see something on a screen. We have to be able to affect it as well. That gets much more engagement and interest in... Uh, Let's see. In part, it is about that no matter how dark our desire is, Videodrome or the Internet will allow us to indulge in it. And, you know, uh, let's see. The the Internet, while, you know, though the Internet doesn't physically change you, you, you know, yeah, studies have shown people who, are, who use the Internet to see a lot of disturbing things become desensitized. And, it, yeah, that is something... I, for sure, if you sit down and intentionally watch a lot of people getting really badly hurt, that you know those kinds of, of videos, you know that will eventually desensitize. And I, I yeah, again, I, I avoid as much as I can that that sort of thing. Let's see, um, you know, yeah, in a way, our you know our minds are changing. Or, yeah, your mind is changing if you become desensitized to, to violence. And it's hard to argue that, let's see, that it isn't in a way a sort of corrosion. In the movie, it's literal tumors. It's not quite that in real life, but it works as a good metaphor. And there are, you know, there are people who have, who, who spend so much time on the internet and so little engaging with people in real life that they struggle to empathize with people when they meet people in real life. And, and you know, one thing where the movie predicted the internet, um, a character says, in the future, uh, yeah, I believe it's uh, Brian Oblivion, we will all have new names, new identities. He says names that make the cathode ray tube resonate, which I realize, you know, if you don't know much about... Yeah, you know, that is the, the, uh, let's see, yeah, television sets, 
used to have. I, I'm not sure if they still do, but yeah. You know, in, in 1983, people knew this, but if you were watching it today, you might have to look that up. But, you know, it's right there on Wikipedia. Now, replace those three words with algorithm and we're there. You know, like, how many people have chosen a very specific new name for themselves based on what the algorithm, you know, is, is most, yeah. And, of course, people do today use the internet for sex, whether porn or cyber sex. And, let's see, so, yeah, so, um, spoilers for Existence and the Fly until you see me lower my index finger. Existence is another Cronenberg movie where he approaches the ideas by supporting that the other side is correct, and he clearly demonstrates empathizing with the unusual people who are hated by other people in Scanners, the Fly. In fact, in the Fly, the protagonist ends up becoming the antagonist. It would be very easy to only empathize with the quote-unquote normal quote-unquote heroes. These movies are more interesting because it shows the other perspectives, so... No more spoilers for Existence and The Fly. Considering that one of the messages that can be drawn from this movie is that the internet can be a fun place to explore, but it also might bite you back, James Woods' Twitter is a real example of life imitating art. And, yeah, media in real life cannot dictate our actions, but they can change our behavior by conditioning us to thinking of certain people certain ways. If you watch Fox News night after night, you know, non-whites are demonized over and over, you're more likely to go out and commit a violent act against non-whites. And while that kind of thing isn't going to lead to literal hallucinations, it will lead you to see things that aren't literally there. Like, you know, someone exposed to that, when they see a non-white person in real life, they will immediately believe that this person is dangerous, even though they haven't seen any evidence of this, certainly not this individual being dangerous and you know in in real life like i don't know how much time i'm going to dedicate to i i think what i will just say is if you actually know people who are not white who are not straight uh, you know who have completely different beliefs from you if you know some in real life you are much less likely to just hate them you know if, if you are someone who currently hates people who are in some ways very unlike you think about if you actually know some of those if, if you know people who fall into that you know uh, you know when, when you actually you know yeah some of them are jerks you know but they, they tend to be as different from each other as you know yeah you know I'm a straight white cis dude you know, it used to be that I was in the majority in, in the West, or at least I'm not, at least the perception used to be that, you know, I'm not personally bothered by the fact that there are now a lot of Muslims, uh, Latinx, uh, you know, uh, black people, Jewish people, and that's because I've met, uh, you know, not not from all of these different groups, but, you know, I, I haven't met people from all the different groups, but I have tried to consume media that they have produced that help explain who they are. And, yeah, you know, that, that helps a lot. Like, if you don't... Yeah, you know, the, the an example. If, uh, yeah, if, if you don't currently empathize with Jews... Maybe try watching Schindler's List or Life is Beautiful. Uh, I, f I find those are really, you know, I'm, I'm not going to make the case here whether or not Life is Beautiful, if it's a good movie or if it made the right choice. You know, it, it makes a very significant choice. And that choice affects the entire movie. And some people hate that choice. I'm not here to argue about that choice right now. But if you watch the movie, it can really help you empathize with the, yeah, with, with Jewish people. Uh, let's see, black people. Uh, this is going to sound like I haven't watched any movies about black people, but I do think Black Panther does a really good job, uh, you know. Yeah. Uh, let's see. I guess I don't have an off-the-top-of-my-head example for Latinx. Um... 
I don't know, I guess Prison Break does, uh, you know, for, for some of them. I guess that, oh, right, right, Muslim, uh, Ms. Marvel, the, the Disney Plus miniseries. And, uh, right, and, and Women in General, the She-Hulk miniseries, although some people, I'm not going to get into that here. Anyway, so, yeah, in part, the movie is about how we lose human connection if we let media take over our lives in addition to losing grasp on reality, the lead actually starts to lose his ability to relate to other people in totality after a while. Uh, you know, yeah, after a while, nearly every... I gotta get better at putting periods and commas in my notes. After a while, nearly every single woman in his life, certainly the ones that don't fulfill this role pretty much disappear from the movie, is someone that he engages in BDSM with, including women that he worked with before and didn't seem to have negative feelings towards. He didn't seem to think of them as someone to get violent with. You know, Marsha, the secretary, but he imagines... You know, ultimately it's not clear if it's real or not, but... He imagines hitting the secretary. You know, she says that he didn't, but, you know, maybe is that a losing? You know, anyway. And Marsha, you know, he whips her and eventually kills her, at least according to the, the hallucination. When earlier, you know, I mean, yeah, he said, you know, we can take a shower together. And she's like, you're a little older than I like. And she, you know, flirts with the, with the young waiter. But, you know, yeah, the secretary, like, he didn't seem to think of her as in any kind of sexual, like, if, you know, yeah. The, the, I mean, cer certainly, like, he, he doesn't, when he is sexually aroused, he goes right for it, you know, uh, on the, on the talk show, he immediately starts flirting with Nikki because she arouses him, you know. So if he thought of Bridie as someone that he, you know, as a potential sexual partner, I feel like he would probably be pretty aggressive. Like, hypothetically, if she, like, complained about him, she'd probably be the one to lose her job, considering when it is, when this is set and made, you know. As obviously ethically wrong as that would be. And when Max thinks he's whipping the... Let's, yeah. Yeah. When Max thinks he's whipping Nikki and the TV shows Mar Marsha, and when he thinks he slapped Nikki and Bridie, he's finding it hard to distinguish between the women in his life that he wants to have sex with, including sex that includes violence, with the women in his life that he's not really interested in in that way. Like, you know... I mean, it's since, wasn't it basically a, a I think it was a joke. He was joking with her, with Marsha. You know, we could take a shower together. He's, he's not interested in her, and he knows that she's not interested in him. I think he's just saying that since you and I peddle sex and violence, you know, it's like we might as well almost have, yeah, we might as well have sex together as a, you know, as part of our, our dealings with each other. Now, let's see. Um, hmm. Right, um, some people have read this movie as you know that that BDSM you know is is inherently wrong rather than just a different way of having sex you know to yeah to be absolutely clear it's not inherently wrong to yeah BDSM any other kind of sex consent is the only thing that matters it's not okay to do in public because the people who might see haven't given consent it's not okay to do with minors because they cannot consent yet it's not okay to do with animals because they cannot consent. I've heard from practitioners of BDSM that they actually have much more open communication when it comes to sex than a lot of people who only have vanilla sex. Because, you know, yeah, a lot of people just feel sex, feel, feel shame 
over vanilla sex. Now, if you're engaging in BDSM, communication is, you know, yeah, a, a lot of the time it is necessary. You know, because of some of the things can actually, you know, some can, some can cause pain, some can actually injure the, the person if you don't stop when it's necessary. And let's see. Yeah, so personally, I don't think this is a movie that believes BDSM is actually bad. Snuff, yes, but not BDSM, but yeah, you know, I can understand why some people might. I mean, that is the thing, like, Cronenberg, in his movies, he often has things that a lot of people think are unacceptable, and he's, like, exploring them, so, you know, does he think that some of this is acceptable, or is, you know, or is it just he finds it interesting? People joke about how in this movie the actor turns into a video cassette player or is revealed that he was he always was a video cassette player. You know, I like a good MST for gay, so I do find those jokes funny. But I do think it's also worth noting that it is genuinely a good metaphor. He's becoming a tool. He's losing his humanity. He now exists to spread video drone. And let's be honest, that is a good metaphor for someone who has been hurt by the media they've taken in. You know, the, the people who have watched things that have given them hor horrible ideas, it's not like they keep those ideas to themselves. They'll tell other people those ideas and or act on them in other in ways that other people can't ignore. Think about all the people who've accepted racist ideas. If they get extreme and hateful enough about it, you know, they eventually going out and they, yeah, they eventually go out and actually hurt people in real life. Not everybody is going to agree with their hatred or what to do you know, uh, let's see. Yeah, what to do with it. You know, many people depend on the mainstream. Uh, how how many people depends on how mainstream it is. But certainly countless people are going to become aware of the idea. And, you know, one of the things that Cronenberg, you know, exposes, uh, explores in his movies is our fascination with violence, how we know that it's bad, but we can't stop looking now. Part of it is how, you know, we watch violent movies. But when we hear about real-life violence, even if we don't directly look at the images, we do at least try to look into what happened or why. Now, part of that is we might be able to prevent it in the future. But the end result is still that mass shooters get a ton of attention, which is often the, you know their motivation for doing it. If we stopped paying attention, there's some percentage chance that a number of the potential ones simply wouldn't do it. Obviously, I'm not saying it's very realistic we're going to be able to do that, but I do think Cronenberg makes a great point here because that is what Videodrome, the broadcast, is it is real-life violence, and Max can't stop watching, and he's not alone in it. You know, his phys yeah, his physical video slip is part of him spreading awareness of real life violence and his body was yeah it's, he starts using the gun eventually it starts uh, wow I should have reread this before I um, yeah you know when he first gets the gun he's not intending to go out and shoot a bunch of people it's basically protection but Ultimately, let's see, and I've seen some people say it is a bad thing that you can watch the entire movie and be left with a lot of questions. I think it's important to note that this is almost definitely intentional. The movie does not give clear answers. Let's see. You know, very early in the movie, it seems like everything can be taken very literally before the first clear hallucination. It's possible, which I th yes, when when the when the couple have sex and suddenly they're on the video drone set. You know, it's possible that everything we see is simply happening the way we're seeing it. The characters are cynical, and nihilistic, but they could exist in the real world. What they're doing could happen in the real world. But the further you get into the movie, the harder it becomes to distinguish between the real and hallucinations. This is not the movie failing, it is the movie succeeding. The movie isn't for everyone, but I do find it frustrating when people give a negative review to something that simply wasn't for them. Give negative reviews to stuff that's legitimately, you know, I think it's important 
that when we give a negative, re you know, negative rating, negative review to something, it should be stuff that's legitimately like badly made, like the room, like man is the hands of fate, or you know, stuff that if you legitimately think this might hurt people, like I am not gonna get into the. I suppose I will dip a toe into the beehive that is. I I can't believe I'm blanking on the name. I it won't take me many moments to find because I know that it was made by this particular person and uh, okay oh okay here we go. The Passion of the Christ. I haven't watched it, and I don't intend to ever watch it, but I understand that some people felt that that movie basically said the, the uh, what's the word? The Jews, as, as a race, are to blame for the suffering of Jesus Christ. And that, yeah, there were Christians who, you know, who watched it, and, you know, some of them already felt that way, and they were like, finally a movie that's honest about it. And some of them hadn't quite, you know, they didn't quite accept it yet, but they came to believe it from watching that movie. I don't know if that movie has led to real-world harm, but I do definitely think that it could, it could make, you know, a, a Christian conservative go out and... Let's see the the um okay there's a lot yeah the the basically you know that is a movie that could make conservative christians go out and actually hurt jews in real life and it you know that has happened there are you know, Christian conservative terrorists who targeted Jews specifically. I don't, I, I think it is fair to give The Passion of the Christ extremely low ratings based on that. And there were 13,302 people who gave it a 1 out of 10. I can imagine a lot of them did for, you know, from what I understand, from a technical standpoint, it is well made. So, yeah, I can imagine it's, you know, it's 5.7 of the overall vote. 24.3 of the overall vote vote gave it a 10 out of 10. You know, so yeah. The the you know, if you're gonna make a movie about the death of Christ and the torture, you have to be extremely careful that it doesn't get anti-Semitic. And you know, we know today that he is a raging anti-Semite, and it's very frustrating when people like that make movies like this because if he's just standing you know rambling on the street which you know based on some of the things he said yeah you could kind of imagine him just standing rambling on the street nobody would listen people would back away if he approached them but because he's making movies and because he's saying something that a lot of people think you know that's that's a problem i i understand rating that low but this movie if you think this movie can lead to real life violence, I agree. I I fully respect your decision to give it a low rating. And honestly, I yeah, you know, I personally disagree with you, but I think it's fair for you to do that. I uh, yeah, if you're watching this video right now and you feel like you rated it high because of technical aspects, but you deep down want to rate it low because you think it could lead to real world harm, this is me telling you, I, I, if you feel that that's right, then do it. 100%. I, I love this movie. I, I want it to get 10 out of 10 from as many people as possible, but I don't want people to vote against their conscience. I... Yeah. There's an election coming up. I think that might be why I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna I would say I'm gonna get off the soapbox, but honestly, if you've watched very many of my videos, I live on the soapbox, at least for for when I do videos. Anyway, no, I you know, but 
if it if the movie just isn't for you, acknowledge how well made it is, and then note that it wasn't for you. It's fine to be frustrated when you don't enjoy a piece of a media, and especially if you thought that it was something that you really enjoy. But you know, don't don't rob other people of a potentially positive experience by trashing something that's well made and succeeds at what it's set out to do. You know, and just look at all the positive reviews. I'm I'm far from the first person who's given this a very positive review. Uh, it's noteworthy that where many horror movies feature more female than male victims, when it comes to characters with names, this has gender quality, equality in that regard. I'm not going to claim that the women aren't more sexualized, though. But, but yeah, you know, let's do a, a very quick, like, okay, so women, there's Nikki, Marsha, um, oh, wow. Are those the only ones? I guess, but we, yeah. Uh, Nikki and Marsha, I think, are the only female victims with names. And, you know, male characters with names, we have his two colleagues at the station he works. We have Barry Convex, Brian Oblivion. I guess those are the major... Yeah, nothing violent happens to Bianca Oblivion, though not for lack of trying. And ultimately, we don't know if the violence... Toward, you know that, that Max's suicide at the end. If that is actually, you know, if it's happening or if it's a hallucination, and it only barely shows. Although there is gore in that scene, but yeah, multiple times in the movie, violence that appears in the in the movie's real life will also be seen on TV in the movie. And let's see. Many times in the movie, the source of violence and or target of violence will also appear to be sexual, like the vagina slit in his stomach, which is both the source and target. Uh, you know, so source of violence when he... Uh, yeah, source of violence for the, the hand grenade and the gun, but target of violence for them very violently inserting, you know, Betamax tapes. Or will be heavily implied to be sexual horror movies, not all but most, have used both sex and violence since the genre's inception, although originally via implying only, but very frequently, especially in horror made by Puritans, or Americans, the violence is as punishment for the sex. And David Cronenberg has said there's some sex in all violence and some violence in all sex. And, you know, I realize some people will disagree with him on that. Now. I really love all the turns in the scenes where at first Max is just watching Oblivion and listening to his, you know, listening half-heartedly, and then Brian starts talking directly to Max, even though as he's doing it, an executioner is tying him down, then kills him, and then we see that it's Nikki who talks directly to Max like Brian, you know, he asks, what do they want from me? I want you, Max. You know, that's not, you know, the, yeah. And that leads directly to Max having sex with the TV. So many movies would have these as three different scenes. Now, in the real world, snuff films thankfully do not exist. They are pure fantasy, but then so are tumors being created by watching certain things on TV. A lot of other things in this movie. So to me, that doesn't take away from this movie, but I understand people who feel, you know, this is this was back when that was something people actually believed. You know, when when uh, when a character tells Max it's real, you know, at first he doesn't quite believe it, and then the other character says it's snuff TV. So, you know, the the I'm I'm not sure people said snuff TV before this movie, but snuff films were so well known that you could just change it from snuff film to snuff TV, and he doesn't have to explain. You know, for all the things that are explained in this movie, using the word snuff. To, which which I, th I think in real life is just slang for ki killing someone or something, you know. But yeah, when this movie came out, everyone knew what snuff film was, as, as far as I know. And let's see. Another thing that really helps for me is the fact that it explores the ideas, you know, the, you know, someone in the film asks, who would watch that kind of thing? I don't think we gain a lot from just moral panic about something that isn't even true. I do think that, you know, 
yeah, this is a movie that explores the idea of snuff film well with, without just saying, you know, because because like ultimately like the the did did Brian and Bianca know about the the video drone? They talk about you know how it's going to the the. What was it they said? It's it's only going. Uh, he, yeah, Barry and Harlan says that the the snuff TV is only going to hurt people who are sick enough to watch snuff. But the movie isn't saying that. That's uh, you know Harlan is one of the people saying that, and he's basically a fascist. You know he's talking about yeah as I mentioned in the in the previous thoughts section. But yeah, this movie and the Spanish movie thesis or thesis which again if you know you know but yeah that's the one standing up there that's why I put that in the background these are two movies that explore it I forget if the movie um, wait is the 8mm the, the Nicolas Cage Joaquin Phoenix movie I forget if that one explores it or just judges I feel like I heard someone say that it does explore it now, near the end of the movie, Max goes around shooting one person after another, but somehow he always manages to easily walk away from there despite panic, which can help suggest that a big part of it is just hallucinations. Maybe he's not shooting anybody at all. But it could also be read as the people are so desensitized from violence to, to violence that even when it happens in real life, they don't try to stop. You know, no, no one, like, I mean, I get that, you know, if you're one person, you're not necessarily going to tackle him because you might get shot. But, like... You know, the, at Barry's, you know, he's doing this presentation and there's like a bunch of guests around. I mean, presumably those guests like each other, you know, they, they do the same thing. They donate to, to Barry, so they must be in favor of some of what he does. A guy comes and shoots Barry, you know, so they, they know that they, you know, if, if one or two of them, you know, says, you know, Larry, Joe, let's rush him. You know, there's a certain chance that Larry and Joe are going to be like, you're right. If if all of us rush him at the same time, he's not going to be able to shoot all of us. And we're going to be able to stop him from shooting anybody else. And there's also, you know, he just killed this guy who is important. You know, we, we only get like one or two shots before anything happens to Barry. But they're like, they're having the time of their lives. You know, this one guy's like laughing. It's just, just absolutely loving Barry's presentation. Which, to be honest, it's uh, it's like a it's a it's a C at most. So yeah, it it would make a lot of sense, but no one tries. No one is seen trying to stop him. You know, Bridie gets him out of there uh, uh, when when she, when the the his two colleagues have been shot. And I mean, at the end of the scene, she almost must realize, oh, you're involved, aren't you? Maybe she doesn't think that he shot them, but like. He doesn't actually. He doesn't. He doesn't let her check the wound, which she at first appears to, you know. So, yeah. And let's see. yeah. Uh, so the line "Videodrome has a philosophy. That's what makes it dangerous." Cronenberg has said far more people are killed in the name of religion than animalistic urge, and I absolutely agree. Max puts on Videodrome, Nikki asks, I, and Nikki is like, I can't believe it. Okay, now that could be taken a number of different ways. Uh, I'll turn it off. No, no, leave it on. No ambiguity there. So, ultimately, it does turn out that when Max returns... Hold on, I'm just gonna double check. Okay, yeah, I'm almost done, because my back is... Yeah. Uh, Max returns after they use tapes to program him, he is going to use it as a weapon against them, but at first it appears that he's actually so addicted to media violence that when it warped into real-life violence, which he early on made, like, he, he specifically claimed, you know, violence better on TV than on the streets, you know, and maybe that's just a talking point, maybe he doesn't really, but certainly early on he doesn't express any desire to, you know, like, you know, he goes to the, the, um, he goes to the the hotel to talk to the the Asian guys about the uh, you know these these um, softcore porn tapes. You know he hears a woman screaming in the next room. 
I mean, if he really badly wanted violence, you know, yeah, you know, he could he could um, try to bust down the door to get in there, and like, if he wants to consider himself a hero, maybe he beats up the guy beating the woman. If if he doesn't, you know, if he just wants to commit violence, doesn't care uh, against who, you know, he could ask the guy, can I hit her, or you know, or shove the guy away and hit her, you know, but he doesn't. He, you know, he, he he's aware that there's real life violence going on. And he just conducts his business, gets out of there. You know, so yeah. You know, he he still couldn't stop. He went back for more. It appears, but then we realize it's yeah. I realize that some people do think the movie gets too ridiculous. I want to express my admiration that they thought about the you know yeah they they thought about what the following would look like. When Max has sex with his television, what we see is basically cunnilingus. Uh, uh, yeah, uh, pussy eating. Because it would have looked very silly if he pulled down his pants and started like humping the TV from that. that I really think that would have just been, yeah. I quite appreciate that over the course of the movie, Videodrome clearly means very different things because media is very fluid. It has always adjusted based on what people wanted from it, all the way back to cave paintings. You know, for some of the movie, the term Videodrome refers to the program, the torture. But later, Barry, you know, he explains that it's not the program, it's about the signal. The signal is Videodrome. And Brian Oblivion says, in the future, battles will be waged in the Videodrome, which means it's an arena, you know, it's not, he's not talking about the, the violent, or the violence or the signal, that doesn't make any sense, you know, like what, people are gonna go at it, fisticuffs with the clay wall in the background, that doesn't make any sense, so, yeah, and he also refers to Videodrome as the tumor that causes the losing, you know, he says, the tumor, the tumor was removed, the tumor became Videodrome, Some, something along those lines, so, yeah. And in a bit of meta, this movie is actually itself an example of how people might keep watching something if it's violent and or sexual. There are apparently a lot of people who didn't really understand or like or enjoy what they were seeing, but they kept watching and will admit as much in their reviews. You know, the yeah. One interpretation is that very literally, if you watch something videotape rather than live, if you're seeing violence, it isn't necessarily real. So while it's not quite hallucination, you're seeing something that isn't real, and on some level, you believe some of what you see, maybe not uh, maybe not the violence itself, but maybe makes you think, oh, that's the kind of person who would do that kind of violence, and if that is based on an incorrect stereotype, well, that means that your idea of reality is slowly changing towards fiction. And let's see, when Harlan reveals, actually, yeah, I, um, that reminds me, there's this you know, an, an earlier case than The Passion of the Christ of anti-Semitic... So, based on, based on what I've heard, it appears that The Passion of the Christ is anti-Semitic propaganda. A case of something that's definitely anti-Semitic propaganda is that... I, I forget which of them, but one of the... The, uh, the guy who worked for Hitler who did the propaganda, I, I can't remember exactly his name right now he 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 got footage of Jews laughing and smiling and footage of Jews like slitting the throat of uh, a cow I guess uh, you know so that the the blood would would rush out rather than like killing it instantly and that's that's not because uh, yeah I'll finish my thought before I get, you know, he edited it together so that it looked like the Jews were happy that they, you know, they not only do, do they do this to cattle, they love doing it. It makes them laugh, it makes them smile, you know, and apparently Hitler himself actually believed it, and because he was a vegetarian, which obviously not every vegetarian is evil, far from it. But, yeah, he used that to say, you know, someone who would do that to, to animals are, are, you know, not really human. So, something like that. Now, the reason that they... I, I, I'm not sure... I, I feel like I've heard that that is still... Uh, um, yeah, the, the blood being removed from the body before they start, you know. I feel like that's still being done... 
but today they uh, let's see is it maybe that they they give a, a strong shock to the the cow so that they don't actually feel the blood rushing out it is like it's a it's a incapacitating basically uh, I, I feel like I've heard that that's the law now in Western countries it's not that Semitic people think that it's funny or good to uh, you know the the fact that the the cow is suffering is not the the point and if you want to get like just think about um, the way that animals are treated the, the factory farming in America you know a lot of the people doing that are not Jewish or otherwise Semitic anyway it's because there's something in the Old Testament about the blood can't be in the body when you start to prepare the the you know the the dead animal for you know, for food it's not that they think that there's something good about the animal suffering it's that they think there's something bad about the blood still being in the animal i, f I forget what I, I mean i can imagine there's probably some kind of uh, in infection or something that they once experienced and now they just always remove the blood but yeah you know Jews are no more prone to cruelty than people who aren't Jewish you know yes for sure some rich Jews do bad things but that's not a Jewish thing that's a rich people thing it's very rare to find rich people who aren't at the very least passively doing something awful you know not using their money to help people who actually need help but instead enjoying it themselves when they have way more than you know while people are starving unhoused it you know you have people spending obscene amounts of money just for for quick thrills so yeah the uh let's see yeah and yeah originally you know there were a number of jewish families who were rich that wasn't they weren't doing anything wrong to get rich they just took up fields that they weren't being literally prevented from entering by the christians you know the christians basically thought well if we if they don't get to do any work eventually they'll starve to death then they won't have we won't have to deal with them anymore and then when they started excelling and like you know yeah banking i think an argument could be made that banking in general that that it should be it should be limited at least especially today where banks are creating a lot of pain and suffering but the jews had to come up with something and just because you meet a Jew doesn't mean that they think that banking is a great idea. And and again, you know, once Christians got into it, suddenly they didn't, you know, they, they liked the riches as well. Now, when Harlan reveals that he's been working with Barry, Max tries to shame him by pointing out they've been working together for two years. So apparently for those two years, Harlan has simply been waiting for Max to seem ready for the Videodrome program, which helps underline the theme that over time you will crave something more extreme. Like if he walked on the day, on, walked through the door on day one and said, look at this torture, Max, you know, Max might have been like, okay, get out of here now, you know, but, let's see, you know, yeah, when, when he sees it, you know, he doesn't, yeah, he doesn't have a problem with it, even when he finds out it is real, he, you know, he has become that desensitized, and the, the thing, you know, when he finds out it's real, he doesn't express empathy, he's just like, that seems kind of weird. Why are they doing it for real? It's safer to fake it, you know. And, yeah, we see from right away, Max is desensitized to everything on TV when he ignores the interview in favor of flirting with Nikki. We see that in real life, he barely pays attention if there is something, you know, if, if yeah, if there's something that stimulates him with sex, he's going to focus on the stimulating thing. We see early on as well, uh, let's see that if real life violence occurring doesn't affect him, he isn't going to try to help. Now, 
So yeah, in part, the movie is a response to critics and censors who said that Cronenberg other, and other horror directors were doing something wrong by showing a lot of sex and violence. And well, yeah, a lot of people have been given in to the temptation to make fun of these critics and censors. Cronenberg engages with the idea. Let's see. I'm sure you know some people walked away from this movie thinking the move of the movie as a confession, pleading for a light sentence, as he admitted that what he had done was clearly wrong. And, and some people appear confused about how long Max and Nikki have been dating when they go home to his place and end up watching Videodrome. I think it's the first date. They're both that eager. They're not used to waiting. They're both used to getting what they want, like what they watch on TV. I mean, why did she wear, and you know, what she herself says is an overstimulating dress, to an interview where she's talking about, you know, like, is there too much sex and violence on TV? Like, basically, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not shaming her, but what I'm saying is she made the decision that she was going to try to arouse people while doing that. You know, look at how much more conservatively dressed the female interviewer is. You know, she is dressed like, let's take this serious, you know, and, and he's like wearing a, a suit and such, but she's wearing this dress and she admits it when he points out, you know, why are you wearing that dress if you, you know, and, and she does say, I think it's bad that we're so overstimulated, but yeah, she can't help it. She she intellectually she understands this is bad, but she can't stop, you know, and that's I mean that's almost you know, that describes addiction, for example. And you know, it, yeah, it's an important point in the movie that, you know, I personally don't think that, oh, you have to wait several days before having sex, but certainly a lot of people do think that, even more so when this came out. And the movie is showing these are two people who refuse to wait that long. Like, they are in the door, and immediately she's like, do you have some porn? It gets me in the mood. Like, she's not even going to pretend, like, ah, oh, uh, uh, the arch... No, 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 she's like, we're here to have sex, right? So, get some porn... I want to, you know, I want to see other people having sex, and then we can have sex. And then when she realizes, you know, it's it's torture, she, you know, he says, it ain't exactly sex. And she says, says who? And let's see. So, this is probably my favorite Cronenberg ending. So, I am going to briefly talk about some of the other endings, but uh, I will be warning for each movie before I get into that movie, so if you haven't watched all the Cronenberg ones you have, that I have, then yeah. So, yeah, again, noting, overall I love all of these movies. I don't think any of these endings are bad, just some of them are not as good as others. And, yeah, so first I'll co cover this particular ending. So one of the things I love about it is how open it is. The strength of the movie is you can read it as all hallucination, partially hallucination, or all real. And I love how dynamic it is. It's a huge shock the first time he actually does shoot someone, not only because we haven't seen him do anything remotely that violent before, like the worst he would do is whip someone for pleasure, and that you know for, for the pleasure of both of them, but also because the people he is shooting are the people he used to work with. They even recognize him and don't perceive him as a threat uh, at first. You know, dis despite the look on his face, they're, they're so used... Yeah, oh, I don't know, I guess he's having a kind of bad day. That's why he's looking a little... Uh. But, you know, yeah, one of them is like, ah, so I'll write the comedy. And the other one's like, are you sure? You know, it hasn't, hasn't it been a long time since your last wrote? So, you know, the exchange is something like that. And he raises the pistol... And part of it is fear, but if you look at their faces, they're also just confused and shocked and surprised. They're like, you're shooting us. What are you doing? We've worked together for years, and now you're shooting us. You know, the... the they, they, they if, if someone they didn't know walked in and started shooting them, their, their faces would not show that level of confusion and shock. And... Let's yeah, we haven't had any sense that he wants to commit violence. 
especially against them, they, like, they seemed to have a good, they, they weren't even arguing, like, earlier they had a disagreement, but they weren't, like, shouting at each other, they were just like, I don't know, you know, it's, 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 it was, it was just, it was like they were talking about just a completely basic thing, like, you know, they're talking about this porn tape, like, they're discussing, I think we need more staplers, uh, I, I think it's, there's money in the budget for more staplers. I think we're going to be more effective if we buy more staplers, you know, and the others. I don't know. I mean, I feel like if we just, if we conserve use, that's going to be a better, you know. But, yeah, so the, the you know, so that makes it completely clear he is at the mercy of the programming of the slit. He has become the carrier of the slit, as the actor himself Put it. Although that was to express dissatisfaction with how much time he had to spend, the, the, you know, and apparently at one point Cronenberg was like, uh, why don't you go uh, slip into the slit? And he was like, you, you know, I, can you can you at least ask me nicely or something like that, you know? And, you know, so, yeah, when he approaches Bianca, who he isn't sure if he trusts and certainly hasn't known for as long as his partners in the company, we're pretty convinced he's probably going to shoot her. But then she reprograms, not deprograms, but reprograms the violence in him. You know, they programmed him to to shoot the, you know, his, his partners and Bianca, not the Videodrome people. And she wants him to, you know, kill the video drone people. And, you know, it's one thing that she wants the video drone people dead, but no, she specifically, again, not deprogram. She just tell, she gives him another target. That's it. And let's see. You know, it, it, yeah, it's clear that she, by reprogramming programming him, doesn't actually care about his free will. He is, at this point, a tool, a weapon, and she's comfortable with using him, using him as that. And when he goes back to Harlan, it looks, at first, like he is going to be reprogrammed, but then the slit turns violent. It turns from a penetrable vagina into the vagina dentata. And when he shoots the guy in charge... Well, we maybe, you know, we, okay, he's going to shoot Barry. That's obvious. We did not expect for cancer. Now, uh, there was another thing I wanted to say about that. Um, oh, uh, hold on. Um, hmm. Right, yeah, just real quick. Uh, so this is a critic quote. Another obvious theme in Videodrome is that of feminism. You have the allegorical image of a vagina appearing in Max's stomach and the fact that once he has a vagina, Max is all of a sudden powerless to take care of himself. He is ruled by the metaphorical penis of the videotape being inserted into his vagina. It is only once Max goes to another woman and she's able to show him how he, control, he can control his vagina that he's able to regain power. He realizes the power that comes from his vagina and takes control of his life once again. Or does he? That part doesn't have so much to do with feminist critique as it does with Kronberg's desire for an open interpretation of the events that ha have unfolded before our eyes. Notice how once Max has learned his vagina has power, the videotape penis about to be inserted into said vagina is no longer sleek and pulsating with alluring life, but now is ugly and pulsating with disgusting vileness. So, spoilers for the fly. Until I, until you see me lower my index finger. I love the fly. I will always love the fly, but something I noticed on my most recent viewing was that a chunk of it, maybe almost a third of it, is actually not particularly dynamic. It's basically scene after scene of Seth's body deteriorating or changing, depending on how you look at it. And the last chunk of the movie, as wild as parts of the movie are, you know, that last chunk is very straightforward. Like, once you realize she's pregnant, it's not a surprise that she tries to get an abortion. It's not a surprise that he tries to stop her. It's not a surprise what goes down in most of the finale, except for the clever touch that what ultimately leads to Seth losing the will to live is the door being teleported into him. He doesn't give up when he turns into a human-sized fly. He still tries to fix things, but the door is not something you can fix. It's dark, but it's a mainstream, clear-cut ending. Ultimately, and this is a personal thing, I found it to be more interesting how where in The Fly and others, 
it's the body deteriorating, and in this movie, it is his mind, and possibly, depending on how you read it, not his body deteriorating, though it may impact his psychology in others. In this one, he actually becomes psychotic, loses his grip on reality, and I love how Cronenberg approaches that. So, maybe I gotta find a different something else to hold up. Anyway, um, so, no more spoilers for The Fly. Spoiler for Scanners. The movie is darker and gorier than a lot of people expected at the time, but parts of it, maybe especially the ending, are very straightforward. Like, the protagonist and antagonist enter a violent conflict with each other, and at the end of it, the protagonist has won. Very mainstream. No more spoilers for Scanners. Spoilers for Existence. This one really is an excellent ending. I really appreciate how open it is. But it's not quite as uncertain as Videodrome, and, you know, that's one reason why I prefer this ending to the, the Existence ending. But but I do. I, I mean, I love, you know... Whoa, guys! Bro, be honest. Are we still in the game? And let's see... Um, so, the... Yeah, no more spoilers for Existence, spoilers for A History of Violence. This is also a really excellent ending. I love how it really makes clear... Let's see, the... Ah, uh, you know what, I'm gonna talk... I'm gonna be making a video specifically on A History of Violence. I'm gonna save the discussion for then, but... Let's see... Yeah, um... I have to admit, I it's been a long time since I watched Eastern Promises. Right now, I can't remember the the details of the ending. Um, yeah, I'm not. I'm. I just uh, uh, skimmed the Wikipedia for the the plot synopsis for the ending. Um, no, I, I honestly, I'm not going to talk about it because I, I don't quite remember it well enough to, to say, but yes, overall, I, I don't remember being as affected by that ending as I was by this. Um, the, you know, the first time and the most recent time. So, right. So the, the effects, let's see, I've talked about the, I've talked about the slit. I have talked a little bit about the hand grenade and the 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 gun. Um, let's see. Right, I I I think I I feel like I saw someone say that the actual like the the gun that he eh, maybe not. Um, you know, the, the once we see the, the gun at the end of the movie, it legitimately looks like his flesh is maybe starting to die and rot. Like, it's not, you know, yeah. And the... Um, um, yeah, uh, I mean, other people have talked about how they did the various effects, so I don't think I'm going to get into that here. Um, I think some of the most effective is the, like, you know, the, the cancer is really effective, and the, when you see the, the gun, you know, when he shoots himself, and then you see a bunch of flesh exploding out of the television, um, yeah, I, I think I have said everything, so that makes this the end of the video, so Hit me up in the comments. Let me know what is your favorite Cronenberg movie. What's your favorite Gory movie? Do you think that some parts of this should have been made different? Do you wish that they would make a new version of it? And if so, you know, yeah, Cronenberg uh, or Sam Raimi or, you know, I don't know. I guess it's not impossible to get John Carpenter out of retirement, although... He is 74 years old, so yeah, you could you can understand if he does not do more direction. If you like this video, please remove your hand from your chest slit, hit that thumbs up button, subscribe, hit that little bell. There should be a link to my main channel page, one, two more links to stuff like relevant playlists, a suggested video for you to watch on screen right about now. I put out one vlog per week reviewing and sharing spoiler thoughts on a movie. 
and and one talking about my spoiler of the thoughts on the current episode of the Star Wars Disney Plus live action show, which these days is Andor. And recently the review and thoughts videos tend to come out very similar to this one. In other words, if you want more videos like this, you're in luck. You can check out my back catalog as well as catch my movie next week. I hope you enjoyed watching as I enjoyed watching and recording. I'll catch you next time. Death the Videodrome. Long live, long live the new flesh. See you in Pittsburgh.